as it was last night. This partisan wave of blue doing their best to support the defending AL champs as we welcome you to Kauffman Stadium for game two of the American League Division Series between the Houston Astros and the Kansas City Royals. And welcome inside the broadcast booth with Hall of Famer John Smoltz and A.J. Pruszynski, Matt Vaskersian. A.J., let's start with the Royals for the defending AL champs, a 95-win team during the course of the regular season down 1-0 and there's a little bit of urgency for the home team today. Absolutely. The thing about the Kansas City Royals is they know there's that 800 pound gorilla waiting for them when they go back to Houston by the name of Dallas Keiko who's 15 and 0 at home this year. They know they have to win this game. If not there's a good chance this series is over quick and without them getting a win or getting a chance to come back to Kansas City. They feel the sense of urgency. They won't admit it but as a player you know what's going on. You know what's going to happen and you have to find a way to win this game. This is a must win for me for the Kansas City Royals. John let's talk a little bit about the starting pitching matchup a couple of veteran starters each with postseason experience and two guys who were brought aboard for nights days just like today. Yeah these were two huge moves and you think about the Kansas City Royals what they lost they went and got Johnny Cueto hoping that that number one start and a starter that he can be for moments like tonight. This is the kind of game that last impressions will make up for as you see a four and seven record and that high ERA. Johnny Cueto is going to have to have his highest gear for the first inning. He can't cruise against the Astros. He's going to have to have his best stuff and hopefully save it for this moment. For the Astros, they did the same thing. I thought this was a game changer in Kazmir. You see, again, both adjusting quite differently to their new team and both on free agent years. But for Scott Kazmir, it's all about his off speed. The changeup hasn't been as good. And he would love to pass the baton on to his teammate, his Cy Young teammate, up 2-0. A quick turnaround after the late night in game one yesterday when a pair of home runs by Kendry Morales were not enough for the Royals. The Astros hope to steal another one on the road and head back to the Space City one win away from the ALCS. Game two of the division series Astros and Royals are next.
Okay. Some of the images from the Astros game one win here in Kansas City last night. And again, after the quick turnaround, we're back at Kauffman Stadium for game two. Decidedly cooler conditions, as we indicated when we went on the air. The Astros undeterred off to a terrific postseason start, winning their first two contests. A wild card victory Tuesday at Yankee Stadium and a game one win yesterday. The Royals hoping for opportunities today to get the crowd involved opportunities that just weren't there for much of game one yesterday two in the top of the first by the Astros and despite an hour long rain delay they never gave that advantage back. It is Johnny Cueto on the mound for Kansas City this afternoon. The veteran ace who was imported for days just like this one. Had some hiccups down the stretch, but the Royals think that they've addressed and fixed what ailed Cueto in the month of August and September. And they have a staff ace on the mound here for game two this afternoon. We'll take a look at starting lineups in a moment, but this one really is about the starting pitching matchup, John. A couple of guys with postseason experience and two guys who, after being imported over to their current employ employers, looked very good initially and then hit some road bumps. Yeah, this game can be cruel at times. What have you done for me lately? And last impressions can go a long way when you're talking about individually, they have their side, their uh, free agent year. But you're talking about a guy now that, in Johnny Cueto, that has to put aside his regular season struggles the adjustment that we'll talk about with the catcher was obvious and they've made that adjustment now in the first inning he's got a pitch like it's the ninth because he really does have to put a zero up as you mentioned to keep the crowd in it neither manager has changed their one through nine for game two let's take a look at AJ Hinch's Astros for the second game of the series between Jose Altuve and George Springer the Astros got a combined five for nine last night. Correa, Rasmus, and Gaddis, three through five. Kobe Rasmus with a pair of home runs to start the postseason. Luis Valbuena, Chris Carter, Jason Castro, and Jake Marisnik, who had a pair of hits in the opener, batting number nine. Well, Johnny Cueto's last tune-up start in the regular season came Sunday in the regular season finale at Minnesota. Threw the ball effortlessly. Over five innings, allowed one earned run, walked four, did allow six base hits, but in a very low pressure situation was able to roll to a 6 1 victory. A completely different story here this afternoon. This is a money start for me, John. This is the start as a free agent. You need to put on the board. Jose Altuve, the first to face him, and offers it the first pitch, popping it into center field. Lorenzo Kane there again today. One pitch. One out for Johnny Cueto. Well, I was getting ready to say this is the type of guy that can get you in a good mood or a bad mood because he's going to swing at the first pitch, and he did. One pitch outs are unbelievable to start a game. But I look for Johnny Cueto's velocity to pick up earlier than it does. He kind of has gears, and he'll cruise, and then he'll start turning his fastball up. His slider has to be a little bit better, his changeup, because this Astros lineup will be aggressive. You either get quick outs or damage one way or the other. George Springer homered in game one yesterday. First offering to the Houston right fielder that swung on and missed. The first inning is super important here for Johnny. He has to get through this, keep this crowd. You hear how electric the crowd is right now. Keep them in it. Last night, the Astros did a great job scoring two in the first and getting them out of the game. And a quick 0 and 2 count to George Springer. One of the keys for Cueto this afternoon, and we could say the same of Casimir, according to each manager, is early velocity. Sometimes radar gun readings in the first and second inning can be misleading. 
but Ned Ghost told us before the game we'll know where Johnny is by velocity early on in the ball, in the ball game. This one two the fans reacting to his uh, Louis Tiant stylings a move that he's called the rocking chair when we asked him about it yesterday. Yeah if you haven't seen him pitch much you're going to see a few different things where you're like whoa whoa wait did my TV mess up. No he has the ability to have different angles. He'll slide step his delivery. He'll do a, a, an array of different arm angles. Every pitch he's had a different motion a different arm angle a different leg kick and as a hitter that messes you up that messes up your timing. That's what it's all about pitching is all about messing up the hitters timing. And Cueto does a good job with that with his motion. You see this a lot. A lot of pitchers are doing this especially out of the stretch the quick pitch. The, the slide step the bull rush as they call it in certain organizations it just messes hitters timings up. And a full count now to George Springer three balls and two strikes and he's towing the line depending on what the umpire says is a legal pitch and what isn't a legal pitch based on the definition of the rule. So far so good he's been able to do it. Yeah. And Springer's able to check his swing on a breaking ball to draw a ball four. So a first pitch fly ball and then a much deeper at bat that results in a walk. Now John as a pitcher you didn't have all the motions you didn't have all that but it would seem to me as a hitter that would mess up your timing your rhythm out of the, especially out of the wind up as a hitter if I went up there and tried to have a different stance or a different load every pitch it would mess me up for pitches to come it seems like with Cueto he's found a way to, to balance that. Here's Carlos Correa now he, he has standing shortstop one for five yesterday. But by the definition of the rule like just no different than a quick pitch when you don't go through the wind up and we've seen some discussion about that. It's always interesting to see the interpretation of how the umpires view that. Springer a threat to run 16 bags during the regular season and it's quickly 0 and 2 on Carlos Correa. It's interesting how pitchers and hitters have different views of the quick pitch of the different motions. Because as a hitter you want the guy to have the same motion so you get your timing right. And as pitchers you guys are trying to mess our timing up. So when a guy gets on base you can slide step and all that. So pitchers think well you can outlaw the slide step with guys on base. It's more of the quick pitch out of the windup that he doesn't go through the windup. You know, there was discussion where he got into some scuffles where the quick pitch up and in, I forget the team that it was the, the Mets. The Mets, yeah. And that was a big discussion on whether or not the hitter wasn't ready. And the Cueto does a variety of things out of the windup. It's ball and two strikes now to Carlos Correa. But his secondary pitches have to be better for him to have success with the Royals. His fastball, he'll cut, he'll sink, he'll ride it up, he'll throw his change up and slider. And all those averages went way up since he'd been with the Royals. And a cold strike three. This is that front door cutter starts it in and see Correa doesn't think it quite caught the corner never made that turn right there but stayed in right where Perez had his glove. It's an Astros team that struck out a lot during the regular season. The second most on their lineup Colby Rasmus now with a man on and two away. Undeterred from the strikeout yesterday Houston winning despite striking out 14 times Rasmus jumps on the first pitch as he's been doing all postseason long lines it over Rios here's Springer being waved around he'll score without a play at the plate and once again the Astros have taken a first inning lead at some point they're going to stop throwing Colby Rasmus first pitch strikes he's done all his damage on the first pitch in the wild card game against Tanaka last night. And then again today I mean that's a change up down in the zone but at some point you're going to bounce when you're going to throw him a curveball in the dirt. Colby Rasmus is going up there ready to swing and he's not missing the ball especially the first pitch. Colby Rasmus is red hot right now eight home runs in his last 14 games. Two homers and a double in not even three complete postseason games this year for him. And once again Ned Yost finds himself behind early. So now Evan Gaddis with the runner in scoring position two away and a run in. 
Gaddis drove in a first inning run yesterday with a ground ball, part of an 0 for 3 game one. I'll tell you, Colby Rasmus is, I mean, he is, he's the first inning weapon, or at least the early game weapon. His home run against Masahiro Tanaka came in the second, but he's driven in the first run in each of the Astros' three postseason games. And he's extended his uh, extra base streak that he's got going. Gaddis hits the hold on the left side with a base hit. They're going to hold Rasmus at third. Runners at the corners with two away. Now Gary Pettis right there stopped Rasmus solely on the fact that Alex Gordon's reputation. I think with two outs right there for me, you got to send him. I know they have Valbuena coming up and they want to extend this inning. But you want to put as much pressure as you can on the other team. And Alex Gordon's one of the best arms and the best defensive outfielders there is. But for me, two outs. Let's take a chance here and really try and put this game. He stopped him way early. You can see how far Gordon doesn't have the ball yet. Rasmus stopped it, stopped real early. And GP again, I had him as a third base coach in Texas, but you want to keep that pressure on, but at the same time, if you can get that extra run, that's a huge that's a huge thing, especially in the first inning against someone like Cueto. So now the left-handed hitting third baseman Luis Valbuena, who was hitless with three strikeouts in the opener yesterday. Also gonna make a much better 0-2 pitch than he made right there to Gaddis. That's the problem with facing the Astros. If you make your pitches, you're going to get a lot of strikeouts. If you don't, you see what happens. Gattis just looks hitterish up there, though, doesn't he? He just looks like a monster in that box. The way he stands, he covers <laughs> the whole box. You got a lot of quadrants you can go to to get him to swing, and he'll, believe it or not, make contact up better than anybody. Astros home run and RBI leader in his first year with the club. As Valbuena fades a foul ball into the seats. Well, a, a ballpark, guys, that was pretty loud about five minutes ago, is now probably in the back of its collective mind saying, uh oh, here we go again. Trying to make some noise behind their staff ace here with two strikes and two out to Luis Valbuena. A swing and a miss. Cueto out of any further damage, but a guy who's been a problem all series long. Colby Rasmus drives in the first run of the game again, and Houston has an early 1-0 lead.
already set a major league record by starting his postseason career with an extra base hit in five straight games. Now six straight games after his RBI double to put the Astros on the board in the first. It is Alcides Escobar to lead things off for Kansas City. We'll post the rest of the Royals lineup in a moment. A little wake up call for Christian Colon and the rest of the Royals. On a foul ball that uh, as Royals color analyst Rex Hudler may say had some hair on it. <laughs> a ball and a strike to count to Escobar Scott Casimir on the mound for the Astros in this game too. A midseason import from Oakland. Who tuned up his final regular season start back on the 30th of September in Seattle. In a 7 to 6 Astros win for which Casimir did not get a decision. He liked Johnny Cueto. Came to his new employer was great right out of the gate and then John hit some stumbles. He has he's got some interesting splits with the Astros. When he's on the velocity of his fastball the command and the change up excellent combination. And Escobar pops it up. That's the first baseman Chris Carter's ball and that's the first out here in the bottom of the inning. Let's get to the rest of Ned Yost's lineup. He like A.J. Hinch not changing a thing. Escobar Zobrist and Kane off the top. Eric Hosmer who was hitless yesterday in the cleanup spot first base. Henry's Morales the switch hitting D.H. A pair of home runs yesterday in the loss. Mike Moustakis three time all star Salvador Perez. Alex Gordon and Alex Rios round things out for Kansas City. Here's the two time all star Ben Zobrist. He had a couple of singles and a stolen base in the loss yesterday. I'm going to be interested to see how aggressive the Royals are against Casimir. Casimir has a history of, of being able to not find the strike zone, especially early in games. That change up right there uh, in the last couple months with the Astros in August, they were hitting 435 off it in September, 429. So. That's a big key. He commands his fastball away pretty good, and when the velocity of his fastball is there, that changeup can be a big weapon. A ball and a strike to Zobrist. And another base hit to the opposite field. All three of Ben's hits in this series so far have been to right. John, while we have a moment, the four keys to the game this afternoon. Well, I think velocity is going to be very, very important for both guys. And I'm not talking about 95, 96, but better velocity. And then that secondary pitch, as we already saw in the first inning, the Astros take advantage of some of those. Those are going to be key for both pitchers as they try to get back into form. They were, I'm telling you, these guys can be dominant. They just haven't been as dominant with their new teams as they were previous to their old teams. Scott Kazmir's eighth postseason start. A couple of years of postseason experience with the Rays and Angels. Here is Lorenzo Cain. You know, regarding Kazmir getting the ball here today, it it might have been a surprise for folks that watched the Astros play down the stretch because Kazmir was not particularly sharp. Noting that the rookie Lance McCullers would have been in play for today. But the Astros like the matchup today with Casimir. They like the experienced guy on the road in game two. They like Casimir in this ballpark against this lineup. I don't know how much Hinch really likes him because when we talked to him, he said he's going to have a pretty quick hook if he sees something early. He's going to get Mike Fires up and ready to go as soon as possible. So he might say he likes him, but back of his mind, I think there's a little bit of, hey, if we got a chance to steal this game and win it, we're going to do everything we can. A ball and a strike to count to Lorenzo Kane. Well, the biggest play, too, when a 22 year old rookie having 50,000 people cheering for him at home, you got to like your chances of feeling better than on the road when they're all against you. So I'm sure that had something to do with it, as well as the matchup. Casimir's done pretty well against the Royals his last three starts. But you go a long way in beating the Royals when you can keep the likes of Lorenzo Kane quiet. And Casimir's done that in their previous head to head meetings. Kane just four for 24 career against the veteran Southpaw. Eric Hosmer waiting on deck. And in stark contrast, he has had some notable success against Casimir in the past. 
Well, he started him off with a changeup and then he sped him up. Let's we'll see if he tries to slow him down again. A long check of Zobrist and a fastball that misses up. We talked about the Royals and how the not only do they have length to their lineup, but they lengthen the pitchers per at bat. They are such a good contact type lineup. They don't strike out as much and they work the count. They don't mind hitting with two strikes. That's collectively throughout their lineup. Two balls and two strikes to Lorenzo Cain. They're pests, John. We yep. call them pests. They don't strike out. They don't walk. They put they put the ball in play. They put good at bats on you, and it just wears you down as a pitcher because you're like, man, I made a good pitch, and so how did the guy get the bat on that pitch? How did he touch that ball? Now I have to make another good pitch to get him out instead of a team like the Astros say the strike out or if they put the ball in play and make quick outs. Another long check of Zobrist. Kane swings on 2 2 and sends a fly ball down to medium left for Rasmus. And there are two gone in the first. You know, the Royals have been put into really unfamiliar territory in the first two games of the series as we watch Eric Hosmer dig in. This is a team that had one of the best first run, first inning run differentials in the American League. In fact, in all the baseball, there was only one team that outscored its opponents more in the first inning this year. Down early yesterday. And down one nothing here in game two this afternoon. So here is Eric Hosmer as we mentioned hitless in the opener last night 0 for 4. For Cashmere he was coming off that incredible July 2 and 0 with a 0 0.26 ERA. And then August and September just didn't get it going only one win against six losses in September really the ERA higher than you would like 6.52. I know they're not talking about me. Get a haircut. The, the chant of get a haircut yeah. not directed your way. Kobe Rasmus didn't even hear it. As Luis Balbuena catches the pop up we end one it's one nothing Houston.
Mobile switch to the uncarrier today. By the Quesarito and Volcano Quesarito Big Boxes, grab them at Taco Bell. And by Bank of America, who invites you to keep sharing your favorite baseball memories all postseason. Johnny Cueto back to work. Top half of the second gets the bottom third of the Houston order. Chris Carter, Jason Castro, and Jake Marisnik. Carter one for four in the opener yesterday. Well, Johnny Cueto in the top of the first allows the run on a pair of hits. Broken bat flare out to shallow left center field. That's going to drop in for a leadoff base hit. You know, we talked about Johnny Cueto coming over to Kansas City, having a couple of good starts, and then going into an apparent funk. And the Royals think that they've diagnosed this. This information's been out there. It's been widely discussed, and it regards the catcher's target, John. Yeah, we're creatures of habit, are the pitchers, and they certainly, he was used to the Reds getting down with him to get his eyes really looking at a pitch down. And you know that Perez is a much bigger catcher. You see on the left, his body and position of the glove, and now look what he's trying to do to entice the ball down for Johnny Cueto. So it's something he has been comfortable with. It's all he knows. And now Perez is making the adjustment. Right, wrong, or indifferent, it's part of the deal when you're dealing with a pitcher and what he likes and certain guys, it affects them. And maybe not to the degree of a four point something ERA, but nonetheless, they've addressed it. Nothing and one to count to Jason Castro. And I'm curious your perspective on this, AJ. I mean, here I am sitting next to a, a pitcher and a catcher. Is, is this real? Is this imagined? What's your take on it? It is real. I applaud Salvador Perez for making the adjustment and wanting to make the adjustment because he's a big guy. He makes me look like a small guy. And for him to be able to make that adjustment, change his stance. He's not only been doing it for Cueto, he's been doing it for almost all the other pitchers on their staff also. He deserves some credit for making that adjustment. And Cueto, hey, whatever it takes to make that, comfort, that pitcher comfortable out there, there's been pitchers that I've called that you have to sit up a certain way or set up wherever they want you to do or wherever they want to give the target. And you have to do it because that's what may, helps them. Ball and two strikes to the Houston catcher, Jason Castro. And, John, I'm sure you never told a catcher, hey, don't set up here. Don't set up there. You know, Hall of Fame guys, they're just, they can just throw it anywhere. Whatever <laughs> visual they have, they just throw it, and it's fine. Well, not quite, but I did go through a slew of catchers. The biggest thing for me is you're standing out there 60 feet, and you're really wanting the best advantage that you can get against the hitter and certain things you like or dislike. And the only thing that I never really wanted, I didn't want the catcher to hide on a pitch inside, meaning I didn't see enough of him, and I saw... The glove kind of hide behind the leg and I didn't like the real real high target where a guy would kind of squat up or stand up. I didn't like those two things. You and Bill Dickey would not have gotten along very well. Okay. Castro checks his swing and from 0 and 2 now to a full count. Now the question is is it the glove or is it his body because you can't change a guy's body. But you can move the glove around like you said you didn't like a catcher to high but with Salvador Perez it seems more the glove is on about the same level but his body is lower than the actual target with the glove itself. Full count three balls and two strikes to Jason Castro lead off hitter aboard here in the second and ball four. That's a plate appearance that started 0 and 2. And the first two hitters are aboard here in the second inning. Well and this is a guy Castro who's really been struggling coming in and you see the pitch just in off the plate. Johnny Cueto has been a little bit too much of this where he's had hitters in nice counts for a pitcher and hasn't been able to put him away even his last start he only gave up one run but as you mentioned a lot of walks a lot of hits a lot of traffic on the bases and that's one thing you want to avoid in the postseason is traffic on the bases. So now the number nine hitter Jake Marisnik who had a pair of base hits in the opener yesterday. Carter and Castro aboard to start the inning Marisnik shortening up. Nobody home at third to throw to first is too late. That hesitation cost Mike Mustakis, and the bases are loaded with nobody out. If you watch this, Marisnik doesn't bunt it that great, but because he placed it perfectly to third baseman, and I believe Johnny Cueto was the one telling him to go to third. If you get the high, he's yelling at third, third, even pointing right there, and therefore Marisnik can run down the line. And you can see he beats it fairly easily. So. That, that for me is on Cueto. Just get the out and move on. But sometimes you try to be too aggressive and you want to be 
overly aggressive and try to get the guy at third base instead of just take the out and move on to the next guy. This is what leads to big innings. That is scored as a base hit, and it sets up arguably the most dangerous hitter in the Houston lineup, and that's the leadoff man, Jose Altuve. Well, the infield for the Royals looks like they're going to kind of guess what kind of balls hit Carter, not with a lot of speed. Altuve is always up there hacking behind 0 1. So they're not all the way in, they're not all the way back, they're going to kind of read it. Altuve is certainly going to make things happen right when he steps in the box, so there's no question what he's trying to do. Carter Castro and Marisnik aboard with nobody out. Cueto and the Royals in early trouble here in the second. Going back to that play, AJ, you know, that's a play where, where the catcher really determines what's going on. So you're, you're right, he may have crossed him up. Slower runner going to third. They probably would have had him, but they had to be thrown to a shortstop running on the move. He wasn't standing there. Play a foul ball that uh, clips just about everybody on its way back. It's 0-2 to Altuve as we take another look at the bunt. You're right, John. It normally is the catcher's call. But you see they kind of had the semi-wheel play on where Escobar is going to third. You see Cueto right there pointing to Moose. Hey, third, third, third. But I think Moose realized, oh, no, I don't I don't have a sure thing at third. I'm going to try and get the out at first. But the way Marisnik, Marisnik runs, it was just too quick. It was too quick, too aggressive of a call by Cueto. And I don't know if it was Cueto or Sal Perez yelling. But the way Cueto acted, he, he was acting like he was making the call. Altuve sends a fly ball into very shallow right for Alex Rios. Not deep enough to get Carter home from third, and that's a huge first out. Now you got to know here that Springer's been really aggressive in these first few at bats. I mean, swinging for the downs. And even though the bases are loaded and you want to get a ground ball double play again, the same thing remains. Keep it to one run. Even if it's a fly ball or a double play, you can't turn. You can't try to pitch perfect all the time. Just avoid the huge inning and be very cautious. I'm sure Perez talking about that, saying, hey, look, look how aggressive he's been. Let's get something off the plate or get something breaking. A 276 regular season average, but George Springer has been red hot over the last week plus. Bases loaded, one gun. The Astros entered this series with all kinds of conversation around their poor road record. Only one team had a worse road record in the American League. That was the Baltimore Orioles. They've won six of their last eight on the road, largely because Colby Rasmus and this man George Springer have done the heavy lifting. Careful right here, John. Careful 2 0 right here to this guy. We saw him hit a home run last night, 3 1 off Chris Young. This right here is a big pitch for Johnny Cueto and the Royals team in general because this, is, this right here could be a four runs real quick and he could be down 5 0 in a second before he even had a chance to do anything. George Springer has been a tough guy to double up this year as well. If you're thinking about that, getting Johnny Cueto out of the jam, he's grounded into only four double plays in almost 400 at bats this year. Cueto crowds him and now falls behind three balls and no strikes. The rookie shortstop Carlos Correa next, and then the left handed hitter Colby Rasmus. The 3 0. A big green light and one that's fouled away by Springer. Uh, you can tell generated velocity right now out of Johnny Cueto, and a couple of them have been underneath and got the ball up. A little fisted base hit into left field. Carter will score. Here's Castro right behind him. Throw to the plate is too late. Three nothing Houston. There's not much you can do about this. This pitch, 3-1. You can see he got it in. 
And as you talked about yesterday, AJ, that's good placement. That is good placement. Not only is that, that is a great feeling as a hitter. You get jammed, you get blown up like that. The ball hit off his label. You can see the, the vibrations in his hand. And to be able to be strong enough to throw it over the shortstop's head, is that's what it's about. Carlos Correa now takes strike one. And this is another huge at bat right here, John. This is where Plato's got to figure it out because Correa, again, can hit, hit a ball out of the park. Instead of 5 nothing, it could be 6 nothing, And you're only in the second inning, and the Astros are, are, are feeling it. Bear in mind, the Royals had to go to a long man in rather unexpected fashion yesterday. After the rain delay, Jordano Ventura did not come back out after the hour or so in the clubhouse. So Chris Young, who pitched very well yesterday, is not available this afternoon. Chris Medlin would be that long guy today. Nobody up behind Cueto at this point, but you know in the back of Ned Yost's mind, he is kicking around those scenarios. And a lot earlier than he thought he would need to this afternoon. Well, the kind of pitcher that Johnny Cueto is, when you get a guy 0-2, he, I would say, percentage-wise, heavily favored to put him away. There's another one fought off, lined into foul territory, and out of reach from Mustak as it's still 1-2. and two. And Springer worked a walk after being 0-2, and, and then he flipped the script on him and got 3-1, although be it didn't hit a great, it wasn't a line drive, but in the book it looked that way. Sure it was. It absolutely was in the playoffs. Two RBIs with the bases loaded off Johnny Cueto. He'll go home and tell his parents they weren't watching. Hey, mom, dad, you should have seen this hit I got. It was a bullet to the left fielder. Well, the same thing happened to Castro. 0-2. He had a pitch close that he didn't get, and then he ends up walking him. So both of those have led to these runs, and you rarely see that where a guy has you 0-2. You work the walk, and it's a deflator. Two balls and two strikes to Correa. Kobe Rasmus waiting on deck. Already three runs on five hits against Johnny Cueto in an inning and a third. I mean, if we thought that the crowd was taken out of it early yesterday, this is a silent capacity crowd this afternoon. They're not waving their towels right now. Still two balls and two strikes. This can be one of the loudest plays. I haven't played a lot of games here, beating in the AL Central for over 10 years. This can be one of the loudest places and the most intimidating places. But the Astros have done a great job scoring three runs in the first two innings, the, the first two games, just to put them back in their seats and, and quiet them down. It's so much easier said than done to get the early lead against the Kansas City Royals and be able to avoid their stingy back of the bullpen. I mean, that's the game plan, right? Everybody goes into a series with Kansas City and says, we got to get early leads. We want nothing to do with Wade Davis and company in the seventh, eighth, and ninth. No doubt it's in the back of your mind. The one thing I haven't seen out of Johnny Cueto is the secondary pitches have not had that put away and a lot of fastballs. Two and two to Correa. He calls for and is granted time. This this Astro lineup has quadrants you can go to. We talked about the free swinging, but they have not been free swinging with runners on. They've been making contact. Their strikeouts are very rarely coming in these situations. Although yesterday five times with a runner on, all oh, 14 in total. The next 2 2. Well, this is exactly why the crowds have not had an opportunity to make early noise. Yesterday, three runs on four hits for Houston. And today, almost the same story. The next 2 2 pitch is rifled into the opposite corner, slicing and just foul. Cueto just doesn't look comfortable to me. It looks well, like there's something bothering him, whether it's the weather, whether it's the catcher setting up different, whether it's the Astros hitting what he's throwing. He just doesn't look comfortable. He looks like he's not in a good rhythm. He's holding the ball extra long. He's worried about the base runners. He just doesn't look like he got the feeling of, a, of an ace pitcher that's supposed to win these big games. For him. And, and what happens when you're struggling a little bit, you don't have your total package, right? So he's thrown a lot of fastballs in this at bat, a lot of fastballs in most of the at bats. Haven't seen that front door cutter or the slider. He hasn't gone to a changeup after a bunch of foul balls, so it's really been he's going on attack mode with the fastball. The next 2-2. Grounded to third. 
Moustakas to Zobrist for one. The relay back to Hosmer, the double play. Two for Houston in the second, but it certainly could have been worse. Early this afternoon at Kauffman Stadium, 3-0 Astros. Bottom of the second, and Kendrys Morales will start the attempt to come back process here for Kansas City. Morales, Mustakas, and Perez against Scott Casimir. Three early runs on five hits for the scrappy young Astros who have come in here and really stolen some of the home thunder away from Kansas City. And it's a quick 0 and 2 count to Kendrys Morales. Well, it's a small sample size, but Kazmir, when the team has had his, uh, given him a lead, 4.82 ERA, and only 18 innings have they had the lead while he's been on the mound. A swing and a miss, and Morales goes down on three pitches. Toronto and Texas, we're told, are in extra innings up in uh, Rogers Center, and Kevin Burkhardt has an update. KB. KB, thanks. Uh, almost must win situation there for the home team in Toronto. Talked about it yesterday as the first pitch home to Mike Mustakis misses high. The road teams have had a lot of success early in this postseason. They absolutely have. I think we talked about it a little bit off the air that when teams put everything into the postseason, like the Royals and the Blue Jays have, it puts a little bit of added pressure on you because you know, man, this team is going for it. We have to win right here. We have to win this year. Because these teams sacrifice some prospects and some talent down the road in order to get guys like Casimir, Cueto, David Price, Troy Tolowitzki. Those are big pieces. A strike to Mustakis to make it two balls and a strike now. Salvador Perez waits on deck. Okay. 
to three and one. Left handed batters have a much higher batting average against Casimir than do right handers. Mustakis lines the ball into right, right at George Springer. And there are two gone. You know, one of the things about the Kansas City lineup, and, and quite frankly, it's been one of the things that's led to so much success. Not only do they not strike out, they don't walk a lot either. It's a team that swings the bat. And perhaps against a guy like Scott Kazmir, patience would be considered even more of a virtue. AJ, you talked about it. He's had control trouble in the past. Two gone now for Salvador Perez. He absolutely has had control problems, but tonight, the first two innings, he looks pretty locked in. There's not a lot of balls that are missing the target. If you watch where Castro sets up, he usually misses either at his glove or off the plate on whatever side he's trying to go to. That's a good sign. Perez with a swing and a drive. Will hit to left, and that one is gone! the same game from yesterday <laughs> Kansas City down three nothing going to the bottom of the second they get a solo shot it's Sal Perez who provides the power today Alex Gordon now. Well, this is a product. Perez trying, they're trying to get the ball in, trying to cut it in on his hands right down the middle. And the catcher knows it, the pitcher knows it. As soon as he releases the ball, and that ball has no break to it whatsoever, that spin is a perfect recipe for a hitter to launch one over the fence. Of course, Perez. Right, of course, right when I say that he's hitting his spots, he's throwing it right where he wants to, John. Very next pitch, he misses out over the plate trying to go in. And that usually leads to danger and damage. A ball and a strike from Casimir to Gordon. Now Perez hit a, a franchise record 21 during the regular season. A franchise record for catchers. Had a big postseason home run last year against Madison Bumgarner in game one of the World Series. And one today that starts the scoring for Kansas City. You know, I haven't seen him most of the year, just here and there, but Perez looks so much different at this point of the year than he did last year. Last year, he was lunging and, and almost attacking as soon as the ball came out of the pitcher's hands. He seems more relaxed and comfortable for a guy that has caught just about every inning his team has played. Two two to Gordon foul back. Look where Castro sets up right here. You can see his targets up and in at his at his belt line. And you can see him reach back. As a catcher, whenever you go in and you feel that reach back, you just pray. Man, you're, as soon as he lets it go, you're like, please foul this pitch off because you know it's going to be trouble. Gordon wraps the 2-2 pitch to second for Altuve, and that retires the side. Not before Salvador Perez can get the Royals on the board. The end of two. It's three to one, Houston.
Well, the Royals three-time All-Star catcher gets them into the run column this afternoon with his home run, making it a three-to-one ball game. Colby Rasmus offering it the first pitch once again, this time to not as much success as he falls behind 0-1. It was a first pitch RBI double in the first that cracked the scoreboard today. Houston with two in the second. And it's quickly 0-2 on Colby Rasmus. Now this is where he's got to make an adjustment, does Plato. 0-2. Make the pitch you want to make to the location you want to make it and put the hitter on notice that you're going to be able to finish them off. That one's right down the middle. So his fastball velocity has gone up in the last 16 or 18, about 93.1 miles per hour as he started off his first 16, 91 and a half. So that's that adrenaline, that's that level or gear that he's trying to go to. Now he's down 3-1. So so velocity is not the lone indicator of what we were going to see from Johnny Cueto today and Ned goes he never indicated it would be the lone indicator but he thought it would be a place to start to try to peer into what he was going to get out of Cueto today the velocity has been okay in fact it's been good those stats demonstrate that what John talked about earlier in the game that he needed to start with that velocity. And a ball and two strikes to Rasmus now. Start there and not go to it when you need it. Yeah. If you start there, maybe you can go into another, even a higher gear. Start at 93, maybe get to 95. Instead, he started at 91, and then when he gets in trouble, he tries to amp it up to 93. Rasmus with a swing and a drive. That one will hit out to right center. Kane back at the track, at the wall, and Colby Rasmus has done it again! Been no changes that I have seen so far in the last inning and a half. There hasn't been a quadrant up change where you change the eye level of the hitter. It's been on the attack with his fastball flat over the plate, even though the velocity's picked up his location. And he's got to be able to trust that change up in slider. Here's Evan Gaddis now on the first pitch. He rolls over to shortstop. Escobar has it, and there's one away. Colby Rasmus is absolutely unconscious right now. Well, fastball that's supposed to be away, and you see, had to reach up over the middle of the plate, and his gear swing right now is in the best gear. Anything up, he's been able to drive. And there we saw the first pitch to Gaddis, a little cutter slash slider, and he was able to ground out to short. Those are the pitches you can't just rear back and be able to throw. Luis Valbuena pops up on the first offering, and there are two gone. Aerial coverage brought to you by Direct TV, now part of the AT&T family. And Cueto did the shimmy shake, rocking chair, whatever he wants to call it on that pitch to Rasmus. So apparently Rasmus didn't like the rocking chair. He took it out. He saw it. Saw a fastball up. That's the ultimate 0-2, 1-2 one, pitch as a hitter. If a guy makes a mistake there, that's the one you can damage on. Here's Chris Carter now. I mean, you cannot say enough about how hot Colby Rasmus is. This is ridiculous. He's hit six home runs in his last six games. Going back a little farther, nine home runs in his last 15. And he was totally unimpressed with the uh, herky-jerky Cueto Stylings. What do they say in Major League? Major League Two, Jack Parkman does the shimmy for all the girls love, and then when he got traded, all the girls make some vomit, or what did Bob Euchre <laughs> say in that movie? I think that's what Colby Ross was saying right now. A ball and two strikes, the count to Chris Carter. You know, Colby Rasmus is a notable free agent outfielder to be, and look, the price of poker goes up for guys that shine in the postseason. We've seen it. Throughout the course of baseball history. Yeah, he this is uh, this is not your typical guy that's in his groove and you can just turn off what the last month and a half has been. Johnny Cueto in that home park in Cincinnati versus this spacious park is a different pitcher right now. And Carter's rung up. Another opportunity and another one cashed in on by Colby Rasmus. 
A double, a home run, and a big part of a 4-1 Astros lead. shuffling around the Houston clubhouse looking like a kid that was ready to punch the clock and sell popcorn at the ballpark today. But as soon as putting on that orange jersey it has been uh, the equivalent equivalent of a Superman cape. I wish he we could have been unbelievable. His, I wish we could have got a picture of his outfit today. That's <laughs> one of the greatest outfits I've ever seen in a clubhouse. I mean it looked like he might have been on his way to like a, a Beavis and Butthead revival convention someplace. I mean he just he has completely shifted gears as soon as these games have begun and he has been playing like an absolute MVP in three straight postseason games now he's been the story for the Astros two balls and a strike to Alex Rios leading things off in the home third with Kansas City now down once again by three. Scott Casimir the beneficiary of Rasmus's heroics and it's two and two now to Rios. You know we talk about the free agent class of outfielders coming up this winter sooner rather than later guys like Justin Upton Jason Hayward Yoannis Cespedes gets a lot of play now Alex Gordon and Rasmus and here's Alex Rios cashing in a leadoff double here to start the home third. Well, Astros manager A.J. Hinch feeling good about the way this series has started, and between innings, J.P. Morosi had a chance to visit with him. Well, A.J., Carlos Beltran had a pretty good postseason for Houston back in 2004. How about Colby Rasmus now in 2015? It's pretty good. You know, when he gets hot, it's uh, it's pretty electrifying. I mean, he's he's got some kind of pop for a thin guy that, that uh, you know, hunts his fastballs when he gets it. He, he can do some damage. 
Early lead again here in game two. How much confidence is that now giving Scott Casimir? It's big. Two days in a row. You know, we, we get in this environment of this ballpark against this team. You get a lead and and things settle in a little bit. The second night in a row where they've hit a home run and we've come back with one of our own. So uh, never leads never big enough in this park. But for Kaz, it's going to be nice to have a little bit of a cushion. Thanks, AJ. Right, thanks. Casimir working with the runner in scoring position. Nobody out here. Alcides Escobar the batter. Home crowd starting to get back into it here at Kauffman Stadium. Escobar punting. Carter to Altuve covering just in time. This is a nice play by Jose Altuve to get there. You can see Carter and Casimir kind of looking at each other like who's going to get the ball. And you could see that right away Altuve was busting it over there to get there and cover have someone cover in first base. I thought he beat this looking at live. I was a little concerned when he jumped at the bag right here that jump for the bag but it still looked like he got his foot down in time. That's a tough read for the umpire coming over trying to see the second baseman which traditionally is the first baseman listening for both. And he's going to be safe. Fans reacting to the replay. They are reviewing this. See right there, Escobar stepped right on Altuve's foot too. You saw Altuve kind of limp off, but that's got to that's got to hurt right there. You see him in an awkward position. Escobar busting it down the line, Altuve busting it at the first base, and and, and that, that that's a huge play because that puts a tying run up here at the plate. John, I would agree with you. It would appear that this one's going to be overturned. Whenever you see, you know, the they're, they. The umpires listen for the ball, the glove, and the foot, right? You have a different runner and a, a much lighter foot into Altuve coming over to first base trying to make that play. And then Escobar jumping for the bag. I'll tell you what I could watch. I could watch these two teams play in this ballpark because the speed of the outfielders, the speed of the players, how quickly they shut off the gaps of doubles that don't get to triples. This is a big yard, an athletic outfield for both teams. And Ball is overturned. First and third with nobody out. The best opportunity yet for the home crowd to get involved. And now Ben Zobrist, who's got three hits so far in the series in five trips to the plate. This is the situation we talked about with Ned Yost today. Will you will you push the aggressiveness? Will you, how much will you push it to try to send runners to steal bases? And he said they're going to play their game. But right here, if you have the opportunity to get Escobar to second base, gives Zobrist a chance to not only get the guy in from third, but get him over to third. Escobar, that is, after he steals. You have to take advantage of that. You have to be aggressive and not play afraid. And a breaking ball is in for a strike. This is only the second time in almost 12 innings in this series that the Royals have had a runner in scoring position with less than two out. Opportunities just were not there yesterday. Zobras looking right field as he has all series long fouls that one away now behind 0 and 2. A little bit of a slide step there out of Kazmir after starting him slow, a sidestep with a fastball, beat Zobris to the barrel. Ben Zobris drafted by the Astros back in 2004, former Astro property against the Houston native Scott Kazmir. And it's one and two. This is a great stop here by Jason Castro. You see how far in front of the plate that thing bounced. Him to keep his glove down there in his five hole, keep it right in front of him. So not only can Rios not score from third, 
but it keeps Escobar from moving up to second like we just talked about. Instead of him having to steal second, he could have walked to second if that ball bounces anywhere away from Jason Castro. Escobar has not tried to run so far in this plate appearance by Zobrist. The one two. The two balls and two strikes now. That's a great take and a really good pitch. That's where as a pitcher you're hoping that you get an aggressive hitter to want to sneak that fastball or try to attack the fastball and throw the slider under the hands. I would not be surprised right here. You're talking about a slide step to see a slide step change up right here to Ben Zobras to try to get him out in front and get a pop up. Still two and two. And that was it. Yep. Zobrist spoiled a really good pitch, but that was the pitch that we just talked about. Slide step changeup to try to get Zobrist out front, try to get a pop up. You can see him way out in front right here. But fortunately for Zobrist, he was able to foul it off and just chop it foul instead of popping it up or putting it in play. Lorenzo Kane waits on deck. Runners at the corners, nobody out. Kansas City down three. Long check of Escobar, the 2 2. On the ground to third. Balbuena to Altuve. The Astros get the double play. The run scores from third, and it's a 4 to 2 ball game. Double plays are the greatest things in the world for the pitcher, but there's been a bit of better timing double play for the Astros right there with the meat of the order coming up. Zobras hit it hard, but. Two outs, you'll give up one run for two outs with the lead. Damage control. It's all about damage control right there. You give up one, you can live with that. You don't want to give up two or three and get the Royals right back into this game. One, it kills the rally. It only gives up one run. So now Lorenzo Kane, he flied the left in his first try today, one for five so far in the series. Scott Casmer gave up the home run in the second. A double and a single here in the third. And is trying to minimize this at just a single run. One and one, the count to Lorenzo Kane. Boy, Kane wanted that pitch, just missed it. Sitting on fastball after a changeup. Tell right there. That fastball just missed. Eric Hosmer waiting on deck with the bases empty. You run in with two gone here, last of the third. In the air and angling toward the seats, Springer near the tarp to retire the side. Kansas City has to settle with one in their half of the third. Onto the fourth, four to two Astros.
the Astros enjoying a 4-2 lead as we start the fourth. This 2015 postseason could not possibly have gotten off to a better start for a team that hasn't been in the fall dance in a decade. Welcome back to Kansas City alongside Hall of Famer John Smoltz, A.J. Pierzynski, J.P. Morosi, Matt Vaskersian. 4-2 Astros, top half of the fourth inning. It'll be Jason Castro that leads things off. The 1-0 pitch to him from Johnny Cueto misses up and away. Castro, Marisnik, and then the top of the order, Jose Altuve. And if you're just tuning in, Houston has scored in all three of the innings they've opened today. An RBI double in the first, two runs in the second, then a Colby Rasmus homer in the third as Castro is retired. So it is with that early deficit that J.P. Morosi had a chance to visit with Royals manager Ned Yost between innings. Ned, early deficit again here in game two, but how important was Salvi Swing to get you guys back on the board? Well, it was important. Anything we can do to get this great crowd into the game is important. And, uh, you know, they, our fans have been outstanding all year long, and they're just looking for something to cheer for. Ned, with Cueto, what are the keys for him to settle back in and make sure he can give you the length that you now need here in game two? Well, he, you know, what Johnny can do is he can get quick pitch outs. He's made two mistakes, really, in this game, and both of them come to Rasmus. Uh, the second inning, you know, they didn't hit a ball hard, but, you know, they resulted in two runs for him. So it's good hitting there. But, uh, you know, Johnny just needs to get a couple quick outs here and get the, the pitch count back in his favor. Thanks so much, Ned. Thank you. And, you know, Ned Yost, of course, guys, hoping for the best with Johnny Cueto after the rain-shortened start yesterday by Ventura. But the fact is, this has kind of been how it's gone for Cueto as a Royal. I mean, opponents hit 307 against him in 13 Kansas City starts. He gave up 10 home runs, an ERA near five. The one-two is swung on a miss by Jake Marisnik. Two quick outs have opened the fourth. Well, that's a little bit better start. You saw the 0-2 pitch right there, just missed. He would have liked to have it. And then the pitch inside, he's changing locations, and he's moving the ball around through a couple change-ups and a, and a curveball this inning. I think against the Astros, you can't live with fastballs, especially if you're not 97, 98 miles an hour. You have to make pitches. And early on, he didn't make enough pitches that we're used to seeing. And he's gone down, I'm sure, and looked at video. Jose Altuve swats at the first pitch and sends it out to left center, handled by Lorenzo Cain. Johnny Cueto's quickest and best inning of the afternoon.
bottom of the fourth and Eric Hosmer leads things off against Scott Kazmir. 4-2 Houston. But the difference here in the bottom of the fourth is that Kansas City comes to the plate having actually shut down the Astros for the first time today. Well, Ned Yost talked about it. He said Johnny Cueto needed a quick inning. Eight pitches. I think that uh, classifies as a pretty quick inning. He got exactly that. Here's the 1-1 one -one to Hosmer. A ball and two strikes. Hosmer popped out in his first try today. 0 for 5 in the series. You know, we said it earlier, you go a long way in beating the Royals when you can quiet down Eric Hosmer and Lorenzo Kane. And that's exactly what Houston pitching has done early in this series. Two two sharply hit to second for Altuve. And one gone. It's a very quick appearance for Jose Altuve to end the top of the fourth and uh, he and Johnny had a little conversation about this. I'm trying in my wildest imagination to see what this would be about. I mean it doesn't seem heated in any way but. I, I don't I'm, I still can't figure out why you would go over and, and talk to the opposing player like that as a pitcher you just don't you know. You rarely see that <laughs> you know the candles are going to be on you yeah, giving him an attaboy. You know, next time, why don't you take a pitch? Maybe he's saying. <laughs> I think he's saying thank you for swinging at the first pitch and only having four pitches and three at bats. Yeah. He's the one guy that hasn't gone deep and counts with him. One away now for Kendrys Morales. He struck out on three pitches back in the second. The only strikeout for Scott Casimir to date so far. I don't know what he wants either. He went through every sign there. Sometimes pitchers, John, will shake just to shake. I know that's hard for you to believe. No, it's not hard to believe. We have guys that I've caught that have shaken. You put down a fastball away, they'll shake through every pitch just to go back to the original and mess with the hitter. John is still protecting state secrets, AJ. <laughs> <laughs> He's not going to betray now, the pitching fraternity and give anything up here today on national television. Now, there's also been times as a catcher where you want to take your glove off because you're like, I've gone through all the signs. I don't have any more fingers. What could he possibly throw? And that's where you're like, when they shake back to the original pitch you put down. Two balls and two strikes. Well, Scott Casimir seems to have Kendry's morale is really tied up early in this game. Morales with the two home runs yesterday. First Royal to hit two home runs in a postseason game in 30 years. Back to George Brett in 85. No such luck for Morales to start this day. Second time he struck out this afternoon. A reminder a great day of postseason baseball continues tonight on TBS as the NLDS series begins with the Cubs and Cardinals. Later on tonight, it's the Mets and Dodgers out in Los Angeles on a 100 degree night in sunny Southern California. Here's Mike Moustakas now with two gone. But what does Clayton Kershaw have to do to get you know non heat wave conditions in the postseason. Wasn't this the same story last year for him against the Cardinals. Yeah. But I'm taking my chances with that man. He's in perfect shape condition ready and a lot to prove I think this year in the postseason. I think he's just happy he's not facing the Cardinals. For some reason the Cardinals have had his number especially in the postseason. I was on that team last year with the Cardinals and people ask me all the time what did you do what did you guys have was he tipping pitches what did you guys have and I was like they just didn't miss the pitches that he made mistakes with in the strike zone. 0 oh, 2 to Mustakas is ripped foul. So the Astros shift out of the defensive overload when the count got to 0 and 2 on Mustakas. Carlos Correa had been on the other side of the second base bag, but after row 2, he went back to the standard shortstop spot.
Two out, nobody on. Nothing in two to Mike Mustakas. Swing and a little pop up out to shallow left center. Colby Rasmus has it. And the side is retired in order in the last of the fourth. The hottest hitter of the postseason, Colby Rasmus, bats third when we go to the top of the fifth. by Budweiser make a plan to make it home by the 2004 fifth by the 2016 I'll get it right Ford Explorer be unstoppable and by AT&T direct TV and AT&T are now one bringing television and wireless together I happen to like the 14 and 15 Ford Explorer but the 16 is also very very good <laughs> George Springer leads things off here in the fifth. Springer, Correa, and Rasmus against Johnny Cueto, trying to make it back to back scoreless innings for the first time in this start. 4 2 Houston. Astros grabbed the lead in the first. At one point, had a 3 0 advantage. Kansas City coming up with runs in the bottom of the second and third to make it 4 2. Kevin Burkhardt will tell us what's happening up in Canada in a moment. Springer's jammed a ground ball out to short for Escobar. And that's seven in a row retired by Johnny Cueto. As for that game break, KB, what's happening between the Rangers and the Jays? You bet. And that's, you know, those are two teams that can get a little chippy. You know, Josh Donaldson tends to inspire competition and temper. And I think Rugnit Adore is a similar type of player on the other side, and they are still locked up getting deeper into extra innings at Rogers Center. A ball and a strike to count to Carlos Correa. Well, Cueto has sped up his cadence a little bit, getting back on the mound, getting after it a little quicker. Trying to get that rhythm that he's so used to having. One note, and we are uh, reminded of this, is J.P. Morosi tends to keep track of such details. That Latroy Hawkins is now on the mound for the Jays. 
and he is one of the three active players in baseball older than A.J. Hinch. Correa sends a ball into the opposite corner. Well hit. Rios is watching it go foul. And here they are, AJ. These are your vintage guys right here. Latroy Hawkins, your longtime <laughs> teammate. You guys came up together, did you not? He was a little bit ahead of me, but yes, he was there when I first came up. And one of the best human beings you'll ever meet in your life, not only in baseball, but out of baseball. AJ Hinch has had such a great run in his first year as Astros manager. Correa jammed. Ah, that's yeah, well, that hurts. Man, off the thigh, I think. As we say all the time, trainer. Thigh, upper knee. Man, I saw Lorenzo Kane do that just before the year ended. That's mm. hard to do. You that, said you've done that before. I've actually done that a few times. I usually do that about once a year, and it's a sinker in from a lefty, being a left-handed hitter. Or a cutter in and you just catch it so deep and so late and people find it hard to believe that you can actually hit a ball off your back leg. But when you do it, it, it knocks the wind out of you. you can see Correa down. It knocks the wind out of you, knocks the breath out of you, and it takes you a minute. Plus you feel kind of foolish. You just feel foolish. You're like, I just hit a ball off my back knee. Okay, so who's meaner? The pitcher that's gonna go back in there or the catcher that calls it to go back in there? Both. Both <laughs> of them. Because you know it's coming too. You know right now Cueto's like, man, I can sink this guy in again. And he wants no part of it. And Perez is going, ha, ha, I, I watched that guy go down. I can hear him scream when it hits him. So now you know he's coming right back in here. You can see Correa trying to get his hands in. Bam, off the Man. back knee. Whew. That is not a good feeling. Plus, you know you're on national television. There's millions of people watching right now. Puerto Rico, all of Puerto Rico is watching Carlos Correa. He's rolling around on the ground trying not to act like it hurt. But there's no hiding that one. Well, the hard part is obviously he's got to play shortstop and move around. Leave him in here to see if he can uh, adrenaline alone get that thing to stop throbbing. At 21 years old, there's there's no pain at 21, John. When you get when you get to AJ Hinch's age, you know that's when the, the pain really kicks in at 40, 38 like myself. It doesn't. It's not as bad, but 21, you feel no pain, especially in the playoffs. So after making sure Correa is okay to continue, it's a one and two count to him with one out and the base is empty here, top of the fifth. And a swing and a miss. Cueto finishes him off with a fastball up and in. There you go, right back in there, John, just like you said. Yeah. You could see Correa, he wanted no part of swinging to that ball. He knew it was a strike, but he knew that there's no way I want to hit another ball off my knee. Fifth strike out of the day for Johnny Cueto, and that sets up Colby Rasmus with two out, and the base is empty. Here's his afternoon, an RBI double back in the first that started the scoring. That came with two away, and then leading off the third, picking on a first pitch, as he has for all three of his postseason home runs. There's a first pitch that he can't come close to. Johnny Cueto paying attention, and it's 0-1. Happened to be the hardest pitch he's thrown all night, too, 94 miles an hour. A ball and a strike to Rasmus. I like I like that attitude though by Johnny Cueto. You can see him making him move his feet right there, making Rasmus feel his presence out there, making him just a little bit uncomfortable. We got to look at how the Royals play Rasmus overloaded on the right side of the infield. Statcast powered by Amazon Web Services. And it's three balls and a strike. There's the changeup. That's the pitch I think that has to be. A, you have to have that pitch against the Houston Astros. You see him get mad. Cueto did when he missed away and got behind now. And there's ball four. So Rasmus aboard now with two gone for Evan Gaddis. And before that ball four, regather, focus, channel your inner chi, 
and go to work getting on base. You know, I got the sense from A.J. Hinch when we talked to him earlier today that not only in regards to Rasmus, but everything. Don't touch any of the furniture. Things are going just fine. Let's just let this happen. We're rolling. Don't say a word to anybody. Go out there and get him. A ball and a strike to count to Evan Gaddis. Gaddis is singled and grounded out this afternoon. Drove in a run yesterday in game one. He doesn't get cheated. I've never seen the man get cheated as evidence of the 27 home runs. Little pop out over second base. Zobris read it well off the bat and is able to make the catch to retire the side. Another scoreless inning posted by Johnny Cueto. Tickets and more celebrate the postseason with your favorite team at the MLB.com shop. And you can follow every pitch of the postseason with MLB.com at bat, the number one app for live baseball. Stay connected. Download the at bat app today. Scott Casmer back to work. After scoreless fourth, he will face Salvador Perez, Alex Gordon, and Alex Rios here in the fifth. Sunshine for the first time here this afternoon at Kauffman Stadium. And the shadow situation may become interesting the later we get into this one. The outfield, as you see, bathed in sunlight, as is the cutout behind second base. Sal Perez hit the home run in the second that started the scoring for Kansas City. They added another on a ground ball off the bat of Ben Zobris that turned into a double play. Very interested to see how A.J. Hinch handles Casimir from this point on if he gets through the fifth inning and what he's trying 
How many more innings will he be looking to steal? Full count three and two. He can take more chances with whatever strategy he wants, having won the first game. But don't think for an instant they aren't trying to go home 2 0 if they got a chance to bridge the gap with bullpen after this inning. A swing and a miss. Third strikeout of the game for Scott Casimir. Well, at this point, he was going to try to stay away after getting the home run that he tried to come in and didn't get it done. Aerial coverage this afternoon brought to you by Direct TV, now part of the AT&T family. Well, nobody's beat the shift yet. That's one thing I thought would come into play a little bit more. Ball off the bat or an intentional way to go the other way. First pitch breaking ball to Alex Gordon in for a strike. As a hitter, you look up and you see the whole left side is empty except for that one guy. Third baseman who's playing in. In your mind, if you can just hit a ground ball to the shortstop, which sounds easy to do, but obviously it's not, you can get a hit every single time. And it is so hard to do because mentally, you just don't go up to the plate and practice that. Two balls and a strike. You know, you could explain this kind of relative lifelessness of a very good Kansas City lineup by just tipping your cap to Houston pitching. And that's probably the first direction we should look when we talk about a team struggling to hit in the postseason. However, if this continues, there will be conversation around the Royals and the fact that they clinched so early. A breaking ball fills account at three and two to Gordon. I mean, that's a legitimate talking point. Especially considering that the Royals won the division by 12 games. They really weren't challenged in September. They went 11 and 17 down the stretch. They're only losing month of the year. And John, as you know, teams that are the first to clinch do not have a very good track record of going on to win, let alone even appear in a World Series. Yeah, there are some numbers to back that up, but I think what the Royals were able to do last year will help them handle the lull right now. And what I mean by that, they won so many quick games and had those days off in between their series, they were able to come back and still do that in the, in the playoffs last year. We understand there's a run on the board in extra innings in Toronto. Kevin Burkhart with an update, KB. Boy, Rangers have designs of stealing two in Toronto and heading back to Arlington with a 2 0 lead in a best of five. Again, visitors having all kinds of success early this postseason. One out, one on now for Alex Rios, who takes a swing and a miss. This is a big spot for Rios, a guy he's faced a lot in the past, being in the AL East when Casimir was with the Rays, Rios was with the Blue Jays. Double this first at bat. This is a chance for the Royals right here to jump back in and especially after Casimir's first walk of the game. The base hit by Rios the double back in the third is certainly noteworthy as a personal milestone for him. We talked about yesterday his participating in a postseason game ended a stretch of over sixteen hundred regular season games without a trip to the playoffs the most among active players and today his first postseason base hit he's able to check his swing there two and one now see I, I, I would be automatic checking just the later you wait to check the less likely you are to get that call as a pitcher I'm always wanting that my catcher to check no matter what you never know Breaking ball bounced foul wide a third to that point John. I think I've seen more check swings called swings and called strikes by the umpires on the bases than any other year in the past. 
And I don't know what the reasoning is that I've heard people say because of the replay, because of other ways to speed the game up, the pace of game, new laws, I guess, rules that MLB has put in. But these umpires want to get the calls right. They care about it. And that's the one thing that players, you'll see players argue with the home plate umpire if he calls it. If they check, yeah. you can't really argue as much. But if the home plate umpire calls it, you'll see the players get real angry about that. And a full count now to Alex Rios. Let's see what Ned decides to do here on the 3-2 count. He sends him in motion and trusts his hitter. This is three straight full counts to start the inning from Scott Casimir. Gordon stays put. The 3 2 is rocketed into the left field corner and just foul. Slowed him down there on a 3 2 pitch. See if he wants to speed him up here with a fastball. Well, you just get the sense, and A.J. Hinch told us before the game, when Scott Casper gets into trouble, it's when the nibbling process begins. And that's really been the story here in the fifth with three straight full count at bats to open the inning. We finally see some stirring in the Houston pen. Rio sends a fly ball out toward that pen, and the Sunfield is Springer to make the catch for route number two. That's exactly what he did. You can see Rios just the timing of it, just missing the fastball after hooking the off speed pitch foul on the left field line, late on the fastball to the right field line. That sun doesn't look fun out there in right field. I've never played right field. But watching Springer, the way he handled it, you can see him put his glove over his eyes, trying to cover up. And the sun came out of nowhere today. It has been cloudy and overcast all day, but he did a great job covering his eyes. Yeah, he figured he wouldn't take the glasses off his hat. He figured he'd just leave them up there and use the glove instead because the glasses look way cooler on your hat than on your face. But, I mean, shouldn't the glasses be on at some point? Well. I'm no ophthalmologist, but I think it's probably <laughs> easier to see when the glasses are on. You would think, but maybe he just likes having his glove up there to protect the sun and keep the sun out of his eyes. The, the glasses, they do a lot, but sometimes the glasses can't block all the sun. If he, even if he had his glasses on, he'd still probably have to put his glove up. So maybe he's just thinking if it gets cloudy again, he won't have to waste a calorie or two by putting the glasses back on his hat. Two balls and no strikes to Alcides Escobar, who has singled today. One for six in the series so far. And a little action in the bullpen. I have sneaky suspicion that either way, this could be the last inning for Kazmir. Josh Fields was up. He had a bullpen assignment yesterday. Never got into the game. He is one of the harder throwers, if not the hardest thrower, among the Houston Relief Corps. Gordon at first with two away. Two balls and no strikes to Alcides Escobar. Escobar is one of the Royals hitters who is just as hard to strike out as he is to walk. And he kind of fits the bill here. He is not a prototypical leadoff guy by any stretch with a career on base percentage of under 300. Yet in something that Ned Yost really can't explain the Royals win when he leads off. There's no math behind it. Yeah, this, it defies it's, it. It's a result driven decision. Can't figure it out. We win when he leads off. So we're leading him off. Two and two. Matty, what you just said right there is exactly why Ned Yost leads him off. This game is driven by wins and losses. Your numbers are your numbers, but if you win and he's hitting leadoff, Ned Yost will run him out there every single day. If they lose, he's going to run him out there because the numbers over the last two years dictate that when they, Alcides Escobar hits leadoff, the Royals win the game, and that's what Ned Yost, that's all Ned Yost cares about. I mean, it's got to drive the sabermetrics community nuts. 
And in the pursuit of science, you know, there are a lot of baseball fans that are looking for statistical explanations for everything that happens on the field. Well, here's something that you really can't assign an explanation toward. Another check in at first base. And when you think about it, the, the true leadoff hitter, the Tim Raines, the Ricky Henderson, that, that prototype just doesn't exist around the sports landscape anymore. No, they don't. Billy Hamilton. Flash Gordon. Two okay. balls and two strikes. A runner on with two out. There goes Gordon, and Escobar fouls it away. I'll throw Altuve in there, not as a typical leadoff hitter, but as a leadoff hitter with an eye on base, gets on base, and can steal your base. Not the prototypical Ricky Henderson with all the power, but those three guys you named are probably the three in the game right now that are the most, over the course of time, guys you'd say, man, this is the, this is the guy you want to lead off a, a game and get on base and start causing havoc for the other team. Yeah, even that having been said, Altuve is not a particularly patient hitter, not a prototype leadoff guy. I would say D. Gordon and uh, Billy Hamilton also, they don't take a lot of pitches. And a called strike three taken by Escobar. Scott Casimir with some impressive work. Two strikeouts in the fifth. He strands a base runner and through five. He and the Astros lead it four to two. Cardinals at 6 30 p.m. on TBS former Red Sox staff mates John Lackey John Lester in game one Luis Valbuena leading things off in the sixth Valbuena Carter and Castro against a Johnny Cueto who has had a lot better results in the middle of this ball game 
since the Rasmus home run he's retired nine of, nine of the next ten batters he's faced. And is not allowed to hit over that stretch it was only a Rasmus walk. Johnny Cueto of course has been a little more efficient. Had that eight pitch fourth that was kind of the springboard to getting him over that mid game hump. Well he still has done a few more things that I have not seen him do before when he was locked in with Cincinnati and the ability to pitch to both sides of the plate and not get underneath the fastball a lot riding that fastball up where it's not even enticing at all for the hitter to hit. The last two being the case and we saw him earlier in the game leave the bench and I guarantee you I've seen that too many times I haven't gone through it. He's looking at some video trying to figure out what he's doing. And he's made some changes as you mentioned to this recent success. Two balls and two strikes to Val Buena. He's also picked up the pace, not only in his motion, but also between pitches, which I think has helped him get into a better rhythm as far as feeling the feeling the feeling the pitches, feeling the ball, feeling them come out of his hand and having a good idea of where they're going. The 3 2 home and Val Buena smacks a base hit into right field. Leadoff hitter aboard for the third time this afternoon for the Astros. This game looks a little different than it did a half an hour or so ago because of the shadows and because of the shift here. Man. Interesting shift. Normally you'll have the shift against the left handed hitter where there's three infielders over there. Chris Carter picks on the first pitch and sends a high fly ball to center. Lorenzo Cain has the glasses on to make the catch. Both bullpens are active at this point. We saw Josh Fields up in the Houston pen. And Kelvin Herrera, who pitched in yesterday's opener, is up for Kansas City. Kansas City of course in a pretty much a must win down 4 2 they would have to think that obviously giving up any more runs hurts their chances so they're going to play this game a little bit differently or as A.J. Hintz can take a few more chances. Ball no strikes the count to Jason Castro he walked and scored back in the second. Yeah, I don't think anybody uh, in the Kansas City clubhouse is going to start pushing any panic buttons. However, as you pointed out when we started the telecast, AJ, if Houston hangs on to win this one today, they go back to Minute Maid, up 2 0 in a best of five, with a likely Cy Young Award winner on the mound who hasn't lost at home this year. That's a big deficit. To overcome not only are you down 2 0 at home you have to go to Minute Maid and face Dallas Keiko who's 15 and 0 a major league record for one season at home. You think that's not weighing on the Kansas City Royals in these last four innings right now. I guarantee you every player on that field knows what's ahead and they know how important these last four innings are and it, it you'll see the bats they'll start tightening it up. They'll start trying to get these guys on base and they'll try and, and win this game. They're going to throw everything they have. Hence the reason why you have one of their guys Herrera because they know they can't give up any more runs. And it's three and one now on Castro. Next pitch will be Johnny Cueto's 101st of the day, and Castro pops it up. More like a fly ball carrying out to Lorenzo Kane for out number two. We have a final score from Toronto, and the Texas Rangers go north of the border, snatch two on the road, and they're looking at going back to Globe Life Park with a chance to win and punch a ticket to the ALCS. Wow. Yeah, that's 
That's a happy flight. Going into the AL playoffs, I would say Toronto was the favorite. Wouldn't you, John? I think they were the favorite. Everyone, the moves they made, the trades they made, and the roster they already had, I would say those guys, everyone considered them the favorites by a pretty wide margin. Well, they were definitely the hottest offensive team, I think, getting everything squared away for them, and then, of course, resting some of their players may or may not have got them out of rhythm, but they didn't have much choices. Jake Marisnik sends a ground ball to shortstop. Escobar flips to Zobris. Nothing comes to the leadoff single to the bottom of the sixth. We go still four to two Houston. Well, the Astros lifted the curtain on the Colby Rasmus show Tuesday night at Yankee Stadium with his solo shot against Masahira Tanaka that set the tone for a wild card win. Rasmus has since homered two more times yesterday in a victory and today in a 4 2 lead. Welcome back to Kansas City with Hall of Famer John Smoltz, AJ Pruszynski, John Palmarosi, Matt Vaskersian. It's 4 2 Houston. Scott Kazmir still out there working in the bottom half of the sixth. He gets Ben Zobris to lead things off and then Kane and Hosmer for the Royals. And he's fallen behind Ben Zobris three balls and no strikes. That yeah, could be a similar situation where. The Q was able to get through the inning but if anybody got on base. They had the barrel of right and left going in the bullpen for Houston. They are ready to not take many more chances. A strike to make it three and one to Zobrist, who has walked and grounded into a double play today. That double play ball did lead to a run back in the third. It made it four to two, and that's where we have stayed. Now a full count, three and two.
And as a pitcher, when you're in the situation, if you're going to be taken out, you want to be taken out because of aggressive attack. They just got a hit, not because you fall behind 3-0 and and you're not giving your manager any choice. So he's battled himself back into this 3-2 count. Still full to Ben Zobrist. We saw two relievers up in the Houston bullpen a moment ago. Josh Fields, the right-hander, and then the situational southpaw, the veteran Oliver Perez, who got a big out out of the Houston pen last night. Oliver Perez is up for the same guy he got out last night, Eric Hosmer. Zobra sends a fly ball out to right center. Marisnik didn't see it off the bat, but recovers to make the catch. Well, Scott Kasmer has hung in there and done a nice job for the Astros. Both pitchers came in here really struggling with their secondary pitches. John Equato, of course, got off to a very slow start and has settled in nicely with three zeros the last three innings. So now Lorenzo Kane, one for six so far in the series. And taking strike one. Started Lorenzo Kane off every at bat with a changeup and then firm afterwards. And we were talking about Scott Casimir in the fifth and thinking maybe A.J. Hinch is satisfied right there. Instead, he runs him out there for the sixth. He does get the first down. Kane's going to put a man on base against him, however. Extra bases into the right field corner. And that'll bring the tying run to the plate. That's just a nice piece of hitting by Lorenzo Kane right here. Down two strikes, you see the target up. He pretty much throws it right where Jason Castro wants it. But Kane taking what the pitcher gives him with two strikes, shoots the ball to right field. Nice way to get the Royals going here with a one out double. Well, it's amazing. He's pitched in the same all three at bats that change up early and then hard stuff later. And this time, Kane gets the best of them with two strikes. Here comes A.J. Hinch. Again, they've got Fields and Perez hot. For Scott Casimir, he had recorded a total of one out as far as the fifth inning in each of his last three starts combined. So that will be all for the Southpaw today. And the call's been made out to another left hander. We'll be right back.
Seventh inning stretch. Post your photos and videos with hashtag the big seventh and hashtag contest for a chance to win tickets to the World Series. Game four. And Kauffman Stadium alive with the thought of an opportunity. Oliver Perez comes out from the Houston bullpen to try to extinguish that. Runner at second with one gone. Eric Hosmer, the batter, still looking for his first postseason hit this year. And way out in front of a slider swung on and missed. Cat and mouse game. Sometimes relievers are set up to face the same guys in a series to a sinker the first time and then followed it with some sliders. Well, this time he started them off with a sweeping slider. Maybe he'll pitch him backwards. As AJ mentioned, this was the matchup yesterday in the eighth. Another slider waved at and missed. Perez came on to face Hosmer in the eighth inning yesterday with runners at first and second and two away and got him to fly to left. Those are two nasty sliders he started him out with. Hosmer went up there saying, okay, I, runner on second, I got to get him in. Oliver Press came in and said, okay, I'm going to throw you my two best sliders I have from two different arm angles and sweep them way outside, and Hosmer had no chance. There goes Kane, and Hosmer reaches out and pokes it into left center field. such a huge jump there he was almost standing at the third base bag at the time of contact my goodness now that's a jump right there Matt even you could steal third on that jump but Oliver Perez right there out 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 thunk himself out thinked himself what is the proper term he tried the Johnny Cueto shake and bake rocking chair and he actually threw a pitch that Eric Hosmer could just reach out, put the barrel on, drive in the third run, and get it get the Royals back in this game. I mean, Eric Hosmer has that pterodactyl wingspan that allows him some really magnificent plate coverage. He needed every inch of it there. What a fine at bat. I haven't seen an 0-2 stealing of third and then that play right there in a while, because that's not your prototypical time to steal with the, the hitter already in a defensive count but it worked out I think Kane saw something because if, if we can go back and see Oliver Perez's motion he went high leg kick almost full turn so I think Kane knew he could walk the third I don't think he was expecting Hosmer to swing at that pitch so now Kendrys Morales a big swing and a miss You can see Kane right there. As soon as he turns, he knows he's going home. As soon as he starts to turn, Kane felt like he could walk the third. And I think that distracted Oliver Perez a little bit from Hosmer. And he threw a pitch, unlike the first two, that Hosmer could actually reach. Yeah, because he was already, already committed going home. You know, the second base, you could pretty much, you can't balk, really. You could have turned yourself all the way around and not thrown to second. But we've talked about his very different Luis Tiant type deliveries and that was one right there. I think he was inspired by watching Cueto pitch the first six innings. He wanted to get some TV time so he tried it. Morales will hit the vacated hole. Kendrys Morales beats the shift. Runners at the corners now with one away. Oh the shift giveth the shift taketh away. And the Astros are beat by their own game there. I've been saying this all looking forward to the postseason to see with all the shifts that go on does this come into play well it finally did because he definitely made that an option for him. Well we've talked about it all day long with the shift and one side of the field being wide open. Kendrick Morales just took what they gave him right there and he threw a pitch away. He just poked it. He stuck out his bat, poked it through the. He had the whole right side of the infield, John, as a pitcher. That's got to drive you crazy. Because oh, that's a dead double play ball if you have a second baseman standing there. Mike Mustakis now. Mustakis is looking for his first hit of this postseason. 0 for 5 so far. 
Tell you what, if this was later in the game, you'd see one of those pinch run specialists come in for Morales, but because it's only the sixth and they're down one, no need to press that button if you're Ned Yost. It's to 2 0 now. And the reason I'd say that is you put so much more pressure on the defense because now you take potentially a double play out of the way by him stealing, getting to second base. Of course, Morales is not going to do that. Ned Yost thinking, though, is that Morales has an opportunity here to get another at bat. Right, exactly. He doesn't want to lose his bat later on in the game. Exactly. Three balls and no strikes. Anything other than a double play ball here, and we'll see Josh Fields out of the Houston bullpen to face Salvador Perez. Green light or not? No chance he's swinging. He hasn't looked like he wanted to swing the first three pitches. He's dead statue taken right here. He takes a strike. Left-handed pitching at one time in Mike Moustakas' career gave him a hard time. That is no longer the case. In fact, he's 16 for his last 38 against left-handed pitching. Did he check it on the appeal? He did, and the bases are loaded. Here comes A.J. Hinch. There goes Oliver Perez. And the call has gone out for Josh Fields. The Astros trying to hang on to a tenuous one run lead. We'll be right back. The run was charged to Scott Casimir. However, worse news for the Astros is that he leaves the bases loaded with only one away and turns the ball over to the hard throwing right hander Josh Fields. Josh Fields uses his body well. He sits in a back leg and he uses it to throw that 94 95 mile an hour, but a power knuckle curve also with a slider. Salvador Perez is homer this afternoon. Kaufman Stadium as loud as it's been all series long in what is the pivotal moment so far in this best of five. A ball and no strikes. Reliever comes in the cat and mouse game. You're trying to decide if it's a pitcher. Is he trying to ambush me the first pitch here at home with all the emotion of the crowd? If he is, I'm going off speed. Now he falls behind 1 0. You still can go off speed if you think the hitter's going to stay aggressive.
That's the fine line you walk, John, especially in big situations when the reliever comes in. Because you know if you throw that first pitch breaking ball and it's a ball, the hitter, the next pitch is like, he's got to throw me a dead red fastball, especially with the bases loaded, because he knows the pitcher doesn't want to fall behind 2 0, which he's done anyways. So now Perez can literally look for one spot to try to get a ball in the air or drive a ball in the gap somewhere and give the Royals possibly the lead. Two balls and no strikes to count to Salvador Perez. Two, three, and oh. Fields misses badly, or was it a foul ball? Did it hit Perez's back? No, it did not. Credit Perez with an RBI on the bases loaded walk, and the Royals have tied it at four. Well, this was nowhere close, so you can tell that Josh Fields is pretty amped up. His first experience here. He's rearing back. I told you he sits on his back leg, but right now he needs to get off that back leg and get the ball downhill. So if you're Gordon, you've seen four nowhere close. It would ha it would have to be on a tee if I'm going to let it go on Gordon. And a great trip to the mound right here by Houston's pitching coach. Brent Strong making his second visit of the inning. This is a total, hey Josh, let's settle down meeting. And also, though, it kind of serves two purposes. He also wants to leave the guy warming up in the bullpen a chance in case something bad, something really goes wrong here and it starts going out of control. He also wants to slow the momentum and get the guy in the bullpen ready in case they have to bring him in rather quickly. That's Mike Fires for whom. Most of his outings came as a starter this year. In fact, just about all of them. A part of the Brewers starting rotation before his midseason trade to the Astros. The guy who threw a no hitter earlier this year, he is available in relief today and getting hot in a hurry. Here's Alex Gordon now. The longest tenured Royal has a chance to deliver Kansas City's first lead of the series. And the first strike from Fields. After Zobras fly to center to start the inning. Five straight Royals have reached base safely. Kane doubled. Hosmer with an RBI single. Morales with a base hit. And then walks to Mustakas and Perez. Gordon out in front to fall behind 0 2. Change up right there. Maybe a little generous first pitch away when a guy's missed four straight. Doesn't get a real close call, but now he's ahead 0 2. He wants right here. A ball and two strikes. This is where Alex Gordon is really going to buckle down here. He has a he has a long, long history of having really good at bats, especially with two strikes. I wouldn't be surprised to see Fields. Try to elevate the ball in it because there's one hole that Alex Gordon has. It's kind of up and away out over the plate. You can get a swing and miss there and get a strikeout, which right now Fields is looking for. A ball and two strikes to the three time All Star. And Gordon strikes out swinging. This is exactly what we talked about here from Fields. I haven't played against Alex Gordon for a bunch of years. With two strikes, he's really trying to protect the play, but there is a hole there up and away. For some reason, he has a little loop in his swing. And with two strikes, you can kind of take advantage of that and throw it just above the bell, out over the plate away, and he will swing through it, just as Fields did right there. 
So now the job falls to Alex Rios, who has doubled and scored today. And falls behind 0-1. It's a 96-mile-an-hour four-seamer from Fields, who after the early yips and the four-pitch walk to Perez to drive and run, seems to have found something here, another gear. Yeah, it's awfully interesting when you come into your first game, you try to imagine what's it going to be like, and then you face the bases loaded in the crowd. And he just was too amped up. That first hitter didn't come close at all. Now he's settled down, got the ball low, and he can use his breaking ball off of his fastball. A ball and a strike. John, how much did that first pitch called strike on the pitch to Gordon relax him? After the pitching coach comes out, he throws a pitch that could have been a strike, Either could way, have been right? a ball. Either way, Angel Hernandez gives it to him for a strike. That relaxes him, I think. That gives the pitcher, hey, confidence. I can throw a strike. Then he threw a next pitch, a nasty off-speed pitch to go to 0-2, and then he could just work Gordon however yeah, he wanted. It resets the mind. If you get a hitter to swing at a bad pitch when you haven't located, that resets the mind. It's whatever you can to get that strike. You go, all right, here we go. A ball and two strikes now to Alex Rios. When the Astros bat in the top of the seventh inning, they'll have the top of the order. And Josh Fields hoping to deliver it there. With no more than two runs scoring on his watch here and a 4 4 score going to the seventh. Two and two. You know, for a power guy and a power curveball. It's easier to overpower your fastball and get away with it, but it's harder to overpower your breaking ball and be effective. You have to have that fine line and that breathing. In a normal game, it probably doesn't affect you as much, but in a game like this, that's the different things you have to get used to when you're up against it. Not to mention, it's been a while between appearances for fields. Doesn't matter against Alex Rios. Two big strikeouts for Fields, who was in and out of trouble with two runs scoring in the bottom of the sixth. We go to the seventh. It's a brand new story. The Astros and Royals all tied at four.
back to an even story four apiece. Johnny Cueto went six. He has just been removed as the Royals are into the bullpen for the first time. Scott Casimir ran into some trouble in the sixth inning, and that's when the Kansas City Royals scored two to tie it. Colby Rasmus is homered again, has three postseason games this year and three home runs for the Houston left fielder. <laughs> Carlos Gomez is still having a pretty good time. A 4 4 ball game. And for the second straight night, Kelvin Herrera will take over on the mound for Kansas City. He'll get the top of the order. Jose Altuve, George Springer, and Carlos Correa tied it four apiece. This guy's got some kind of arm. You saw the first pitch at 98. Tremendous changeup slider. Velocity's not going to mess with Altuve. There's a new right fielder for the Royals as well. As Alex Rios comes out in favor of Paulo Orlando. Jose Altuve hitless today 0 for 3. Saw a total of five pitches to make three outs. It takes a strike here to make it two balls and a strike. And if I'm Altuve I'm having my pants down. Make the strike zone even harder to. Emulate for the umpire. I'm taking those things down. <laughs> One of my ex teammates, John, I believe it was Michael Tucker, used to say, if you're facing a really good pitcher, you always have to wear your pants down because you don't want the umpire to know where the bend in your knee is. Yeah. It gives him a better visual. So if you're just facing an average pitcher, but if you're facing a John Smoltz or a Tom Glavin or Greg Maddox one of those Hall of Fame guys and you always wanted to have your pants down. 2 2 is bounced over the mound for Escobar who gets to it to take care of Altuve. Kelvin Herrera on back to back days. This is something that Ned Yost feels very comfortable with. He's worked in back to back days 17 times this year. And on those days those back to backs the second day he has a 2.16 ERA an opponent's batting average of around 200 all the numbers right in line with what he would do on a day or two's rest. Here's George Springer now with one gone. A ball and no strikes. Ned Yost yet to have the opportunity to unwrap Wade Davis at the very end of his bullpen and hoping for such chance today. Well, one way or another, if the game's tied, he'll be in come ninth inning because you don't save your closer at home for anything once he gets past nine innings unless it really goes long. In the absence of Greg Holland, Wade Davis moved into the closer's role, and the Royals really did not miss a beat. And I know we talked about trying to keep it in the same fashion where one inning now just one inning for Wade Davis but I would be hard pressed if they've got the lead to squeeze out another extra out or two. I would look for that later on to be prepared to do that. That's how much this win would mean to the Royals getting back in the series with all that we've talked about what's looming. Springer unable to check that one. Well, this game is really, other than having the lead as it's tied, this is what the Royals want. The Royals want to get to Herrera. They want to get to Madsen. They want to get to Wade Davis. With them giving them the opportunity to shut the other team down and give their offense an opportunity to score. This is what Ned Yost wants. Swing and a miss. And there are two gone in the seventh. Well, this is just gasoline. Ties him up inside. Springer's been trying to attack the fastball all series and had some success. I tell you, George Springer has a little Hunter Pence in him. Here's Carlos Correa now. He can look unorthodox at times. He's going to wow you with some magnificent days. And then there are times when he's going to be tied up like that where you think, wow, you know, he's. He's not arrived yet. 
And even though Hunter Pence is nowhere near this matchup, his spirit lives. It's <laughs> unbelievable. Well, nope. much, much like much like Ventura, I told you he looks like he's kicking a field goal. Herrera is looking like, I'm going to look at the center fielder when I'm done with this. Yeah, all the way around, and how you doing? <laughs> now, what happens if there's a comebacker? Does you just hit him in the back? No, that's when he struck somebody, struck oh. somebody out. The ball and a strike to count to Correa. Carlos has had a rough afternoon, a couple of strikeouts and a double play ball. And a nasty foul ball off his back leg. Can't wait to watch this kid as he, well, I'd hate to say matures. He's already mature playing wise. But what a stud. In the bottom of the seven, Kansas City will have the top of the order Escobar, Zobrist, and Kane. Two teams that have had a lot of success with late leads. We're talking about a late tie today. Back up the middle and through a base hit. That's what I'm talking about. I mean, he's, he just. Always seems patient under control. You don't see a lot of wild swings for a young player and just waiting for a pitch over the plate, the slider that backs up. No big thing other than a little limp in his gait. That's a good at bat right there by Carlos Correa. Facing a guy that throws 100 miles an hour to have the ability to not panic, slow everything down, back the ball up, and stay up the middle. That's one of those at bats you look back on when you're 21 years old, like he is, when you become 25 year olds and say, man, I can really hit that kid can really hit. That's a big base hit with two out because it keeps the inning alive for the hottest hitter this postseason Colby Rasmus. Picks on another first pitch. And fouls that one off. Good thing that was 99 and not 95 John because we could have had a 6 4 ball game real quick with the way Colby Rasmus is swinging the bat. I mean, that was in his happy zone. It's amazing how at certain times the guys can play in slow motion. He may play slow motion all the time. So, <laughs> but it's amazing how the game slows down for certain guys at this time of the year or in the regular season. You may not see that. Rasmus, if you're just tuning in, has not only homered today. He homered yesterday. He homered Tuesday in the wild card game and going back further still he's hit nine in his last 15. Two and two. Check the count of ball and two strikes one and two to Colby Rasmus. His first inning RBI double today set a major league record. His sixth consecutive postseason game with an extra base hit. That's the most among players playing in their first postseason games. How about that? 92 mile an hour changeup. That's a nice weapon to have right there. 100 mile an hour fastball and a changeup harder than most guys can throw their fastball. Well, they say you want about eight miles difference on that pitch, and I guess that's what it is. <laughs> And it'll go all the way full now to three balls and two strikes. Devin Gaddis waits next with two away. Correa will be running from first. Now, if I'm Colby Rasmus right here hitting, my chips are all in. I'm getting a changeup right here. Knowing really? Herrera, knowing what his pitches are, I just have two? a feeling with the runner going, Gaddis hitting behind him. And he got a heater, and he missed it. The trio of defenders, it's Hosmer on the mound to make the catch. Nothing in the Houston seventh.
Well, the Astros jumped out to an early lead this afternoon with two in the bottom of the six. Kansas City has come back to tie things up. Welcome back to Kauffman Stadium. Bottom half of the seventh. And Alcides Escobar leads things off against the new pitcher, Will Harris, with a drive in the right center that somehow drops between Marisnik and Springer. Escobar to third. Springer was playing so shallow there's no way he could have got to this ball and a long run you see how shallow right there the run he's got to make in Springer and just Marisna could not catch up to this ball a rare ball that would drop in this athletic outfield whenever you're hitting and you see the outfielder turn your turn his back on a ball you hit that's usually a good feeling you know it's usually going to be over his head but with how shallow Springer was playing Obviously the Astros do not believe that Escobar had the power to get it over his head and then Marisnik ran two miles I think to get to that ball and then he kicked it which allowed Escobar to go over to third. The Houston bullpen which had held up so nicely in the wild card game and then again last night in game one of this series showed a crack in the sixth inning. A couple of walks two hits. Well, I'm telling you, Matty, I know this new era that we're in is all about bullpen and construction of it. But if you don't get depth out of your starting pitching over a consistent period of time, you're really putting it in the hands of a hitting team that says, I couldn't hit that guy. Now we at least got a chance against some matchups. Here's Ben Zobris now. He's got three base hits so far in this series, including a first inning single this afternoon. The go ahead run at third with nobody out. The infield is pulled in for Houston. Will Harris appeared yesterday, gave up a couple of hits in two thirds of an inning. And Kansas City has taken its first lead of the series. You want to talk about a guy taking what the other team gives him right here? It's Ben Zobrist on this curveball stays back and he had a modified shift even with the infield in the whole left side pretty much was open to the infield he just stays back on this curveball hits it through left field drives the go ahead running this is good professional hitting right here this is something that you see veteran guys do they don't panic in situations and they do take what the other team has given them that's just a great swing by Ben Zobrist for Ben Zobrist and you saw the little fist pump there that's just his second hit with runners in scoring position in his postseason career. Had been just one for 18. Well, maybe learning from the past, uh, whether it be too anxious when runners in scoring position, you try too hard. But I like what you said right there, AJ. I mean, he, he knew pretty much he was going to get something off speed. He wasn't going to try and pull it. He was going to hit it the other way. And it worked out. Lorenzo Cain has doubled and scored this afternoon and falls behind nothing and one. And, and the reason I make that comment about the starters, you're talking about two guys, uh, you know, on their free agent years and not coming in here rolling. But these are games typically in a regular season. You're going to let those guys keep going. But based on the way they were coming in, especially for Kazmir and the, and the Astros, you figured, OK, five and a third. Or whatever it was, I'm going to now turn it over to my bullpen with the lead and hope that it works out. Unfortunately, it hasn't to this point for the Astros not trailing by one. The Royals are about to get ultra aggressive. I have a feeling. Zobrist, you're going to see Zobrist on the run here before too much longer, just to try to keep the pressure on the Houston Astros. Now they have a lead. Now they can do all those things they like to do. They can steal bases. They can try and take the extra base. Ned Rios can hit and run. He can put pressure on the Astros in ways they haven't been able to do up until now because they haven't had a traffic on the bases and they haven't had guys like Zobrist and the guys off the bench Dyson and Gore that can really press the issue and make the Astros have to cover holes and cover bases when guys are stealing. Nothing into the count to Lorenzo Cain Zobrist off first. Did he check it. He did. A 
Well, one thing you know if you're A.J. Hintz, and I know there's an off day tomorrow and it resets your bullpen, but the guy that really resets your bullpen is your game three starter, Dallas Keiko. It's nice to know you have a guy like that typically more times out of not going to give you seven, eight, possibly nine innings. Harris is one, two. Kane sends it to second. Altuve to Correa for one. The relay back to Carter is not in time. Astros settle with one out on the play. Maybe anybody other than Lorenzo Kane is doubled up on that ball. Remember Lorenzo coming off of the same kind of thing that Correa did. Fouled it off his knee and he comes in and just at the nick of time gets that foot down before you secure the ball in the glove. That's the difference. Is that the rule? It has yes. to be secured? Yes. No, it can't just be in the glove. It has to be secured in the glove. Yes. Okay, John. From now on, whenever I'm playing and we have replays, I'm, I'm going to call you and be asked if you secured the ball because no one seems to be able to figure that one out. Don't call him. He won't pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Hosmer now with a runner at first to run in and one away. Eric Hosmer got his first base hit of this postseason back in the sixth. On an 0 2 slider from Oliver Perez with Lorenzo Kane breaking from second base. It was a little duck snort off the end of the bat. Uh, what they referred to, AJ, correct my vernacular if I'm wrong, as a thang. And it was good enough to get Hosmer off the Schneid. It's a knock. That's all Eric Hosmer cares about with it. There's a fly ball into the opposite field for Rasmus. And there are two gone. Here comes A.J. Hinch. Headed to the mound with a purpose. I doubt they want to let Kendrys Morales bat from the left side. And that's why we're going to see Tony Sip here. A pitching change. We'll be right back. Well, it may have taken a bit longer than they thought at the start of the series, but some 15 or so innings into this American League Division Series, there is plenty of energy in Royal Blue. Kansas City gets a run in the bottom of the seventh. They enjoy their first lead of the series, and perhaps looking to add on will be Kendrys Morales. Will bat with a man aboard to run in and two away in the seventh. Ben Zobrist's RBI single, the difference in a 5-4 game. 
and making his second straight appearance in this series, the veteran left-hander Tony Sip. Tony Sip, we saw him again. He's got a pretty good fastball, not to mention the slider, and he can uh, come right after you. Sip not only appeared last night, but he appeared in the wild card win Tuesday at Yankee Stadium. And the Astros wanting to turn Kendry's Morales around right handed, where only four of his 22 home runs were hit in the regular season. Not only that, Matty, but Tony Sip's numbers, he's a reverse reverse split guy, meaning he gets right handed hitters out better than he does left handed hitters. And that's that's rare for a lefty, knowing you had that luxury to bring in a lefty to face a righty. A ball and a strike. Astros overload the left side of the infield. Statcast powered by Amazon Web Services. <laughs> They're going to stick by their guns, John. <laughs> no, I get it. I get it. I, I, I just, I just can't believe how big. I see four, six, seven, eight, ten trucks you could drive through there, right side. Slow roller to third for Valbuena to retire the side. Kansas City has taken their first lead of the series, however. We go to the eighth. It's five to four Royals. Find new roads by Direct TV. Call 1 800 Direct TV and by Esurance, official sponsor of Major League Baseball. Kauffman Stadium in Kansas City, been around since 1973. They knew it as Royal Stadium back then, and though there are newer ballparks, certainly on the landscape, not too many finer as far as I'm concerned. The Geico in game box score for the visiting Houston Astros. Jose Altuve did a lot of damage yesterday. Not the case today. 0 for 4. Another home run for Colby Rasmus, however. That's three in as many postseason games for him this year. Evan Gaddis is the first to lead off here in the eighth. He'll do so against Ryan Madsen, who's making his second straight appearance in this series. Gaddis, Valbuena, and Carter here for the Astros. 
down a run trailing for the first time in this series. Another rollover ground ball for Escobar. We talk about Rasmus being so hot for the Astros. And that's a theme of sort in our Maytag trivia question today. Who holds the Astros all time record for home runs in consecutive postseason games? I got to go with Beltran. Is there got? anybody else in the Astros list that like, even pops up? I mean, you're usually close if you guess Jeff Bagwell and things like that, right? Beltran had that one 04 yeah. postseason where he had home runs, it seemed like every bat. We will pay that off with an answer shortly. Luis Valbuena now with one away. He has singled this afternoon. Now the shadows are completely gone. You see right there, and as you mentioned, this stadium, beautiful stadium. I've never seen so much blue in my life from the stands, just filled with everybody with their Royals blue on. I mean, everywhere you look. Be interesting to see when we get to Kansas City, when we get to Houston, how electric that place is going to be as they await their team return home. Yeah, anticipating a sellout crowd for game three of the series. That will, by the way, be on MLB Network on Sunday. And then we're back on FS1 for the remainder of the series. Dallas Keiko will get the ball for Houston. John, you talk about all the blue here in Kansas City. Does that mean the Astros fans will be wearing orange? I would think so. So, like, we have a blue out here. They'll go orange out in Houston. Something like that. It's going to be loud. Roof closed. I think, right? Uh, the roof will be closed, we're told, yes. Edinson Volquez and Dallas Keiko Sunday on MLB Network. Who makes that decision for does Major League Baseball or the Astros I believe get to make that decision? That's a league call. Yep. I think the Astros, the decision MLB. is taken out of their hands. That is in the postseason. A swing and a miss. A strikeout for Madsen. Two gone in the eighth. Aerial coverage this afternoon brought to you by Direct TV, now part of the AT&T family. Well, either way, for me, this year has become the coming out party of hats that were normally in the closets. The Blue Jays, the Astros. Yeah. The Cubs always have fans that put their hats on, but they're out. Pirates the last three years, and of course, Kansas City now in the last two years. Chris Carter has singled and scored today. He's hit safely in both games of the series so far. And is always a deep threat. Yeah, I said it like he's A.J. Green or something. <laughs> <laughs> Matson out of the stretch with the bases empty, and Carter's unable to check his swing. <laughs> This is just a bad swing by Chris Carter. He's looking for a ball he can drive. He sees it start in. You see him try to bring his hands in, but he just can't stop. If he would have hit that ball, it would have hit off his back leg like Correa did earlier in the game. The bad news for teams like the Astros in circumstances like this one is that since the start of last season, the Royals are 151 wins and four losses when leading after seven. 151 and four, and that includes last year's postseason. They don't give them up very often, folks. Pretty darn good. I mean, it almost makes you wonder what happened in those four games. Were those the, were those the days that Davis or Herrera or Madsen or? Holland when he was healthy were those guys shut down because they had thrown too many days in a row <laughs> yeah. those those four games it begs the question a swing and a miss and a one two three eight by Ryan Madsen
Tag trivia question payoff. The Astros all time record for consecutive postseason games with a home run. Carlos Beltran, five of them. Fortunately, I witnessed it. Back in 2004, Carlos Beltran used that to uh, net him an enormous free agent deal. And who knows, maybe the same thing is in Kobe Rasmus's future, should things continue for him. Mike Moustakis leads things off in the eighth. Tony Sipp continues on the mound for the Astros. It'll be Moustakis, Perez, and Gordon looking for a little late insurance. Kansas City got their first lead of the series in the seventh, and they hold that 5 4 lead here in the eighth. Two balls and a strike. This will probably be Tony Sibbs' last hitter. You have Nishik down there warming up. Sal Perez on deck. Guy, if Mustakas happens to get on base, they're going to be looking for a double play ball with, with Nishik's funky delivery. He's definitely a guy that can entice Salvador Perez to hit into a double play. Plus, A.J. Hinch doesn't want to run Sip out there too long, especially after pitching last night. To two and two now. And Mustaka is thinking that was a generous outside corner. A couple of Royals not too happy. Been barking a few times now with the strike zone. And you see Rayo with two strikes is going to move more over to traditional shortstop. Mustaka has made some changes in spraying the ball differently than last year. Full count now, three and two. Mike looking for his first hit in this postseason 0 for 5. He has been on base via the base on balls and yesterday he was hit by a pitch. <laughs> Sip sets the 3 2 home. And Mustakis flares a broken bat ball out into foul territory out of play. It's been a challenging year for Mike Mustakis, as has been uh, well documented locally. Royal fans certainly familiar with his story. Lost his mother after a battle with cancer this season. And after going through adversity on the field the last couple of years, remember last year Mike was at one point sent down to AAA. Before coming back, having a huge postseason, and then enjoying his best full big league season this year. And then there was personal adversity this season as well. Here is the 3 2 home. Popped him up, fouled him away. Well, I'm talking to Ned. He made serious changes coming into spring training, making sure that the shift wasn't going to beat him throughout the year and being able to go the other way and hit the ball. This is something he made a priority and it's paid off in his average because hitting into that shift constantly and your whole confidence and everything that AJ talked about just starts messing with your head. Well that script sounds familiar with sending the guy down. They did that to Alex Gordon a few years ago and look what he came when he came back what he turned into. Lined into right right at George Springer. Boy, that's the second Adam ball that Mustakas has sent to right field today. And to your point, AJ, that's going to be all for Tony Sip. AJ Hinch out with the hook in his pocket. A pitching change here in the last of the eighth. We'll be right back.
tonight on TBS the NLDS begins in Los Angeles. It's the Mets and Dodgers the Cubs taking on the Cardinals baseball all day long and the NLDS kicking off over on TBS. How about Jacob DeGrom and Clayton Kershaw on a 105 degree day at Chavez Ravine later on tonight. That's going to be fun to watch. Ten to eight. It's <laughs> <laughs> just like we figured right. AJ your former twins teammate Pat Neshek takes over here with one out and the base is empty in the eighth. It's exactly how you would teach a young kid to throw a baseball right here small T. Yeah it's very unorthodox he doesn't really square up he kind of goes and misses a, a portion of the windup. Lately he hasn't had the sink and or the break on his slider struggling down the stretch. Open the second kind of season here the playoffs will get him back on track. We talked about the deception last night with Chris Young. This guy 100% relies on deception in his motion. Sal Perez into the opposite corner, slicing foul. But the one thing that made him so nasty with St. Louis is he kept the ball down and had movement, and then he could sweep that slider. And the last few breaking balls in the last couple games just did not move, which tells me a little bit of fatigue and not being able to stay back. Because when you throw that way, you're relying. Because you don't close that front shoulder, you're relying on that ball to do exactly what you hope to do is sink in and slide away. Saw that pitch right there, didn't have much to it. Astros in their shift. Statcast powered by Amazon Web Services in the pole shift for the right handed hitting Salvador Perez, who beats it. Well, that's just been happening all day long. Once again the Royals beat the shift. How do they do it? They take what the pitchers giving them. Watch Salvador Perez. He looks up. He sees Chris Carter covering the whole right side of the infield. Nishik throws the ball away. All he does is reach out stick the barrel on the ball. If you're in normal defense that's a ground ball to second base. That's an easy out for Altuve if he's in normal position. But you see the slider up didn't break. Just reaches out puts the barrel on the ball gets an easy base hit. Well that's a total of three outs that have been denied the Astros because of the shift philosophy today. Remember Kenry's Morales hit a ball that would have been an easy double play ball back in the sixth. And then the base hit by Salvador Perez here. Oh one to Alex Gordon is fouled off. Pat Nishak working on significant rest. In fact his last three appearances to wind down the regular season each came with at least four days of rest. And that after not working with that much rest all season long. Again with the day off tomorrow just about everybody available. Here's the 0 2. Another base hit into right field. Perez chugging around the third and the Royals are in business with one out in the eighth. Well, the one misconception everyone makes about side armors is oh they don't get tired they can go just about every day Well, they're hoping the rest will allow them to get back to where he was and so far this inning he has not made those quality pitches. You don't have movement from down there and you can't make the ball spin or move away from right handers. That deception doesn't become as. A much of a strength against the hitters. A pitch runner at first as Gordon is removed for the speedster Gerard Dyson. And this is Ned Yost finally being able to flex his roster muscles. Paulo Orlando the batter making his first plate appearance after coming on defensively a couple of innings ago. A swing and a miss. One good thing that Nishak has going is he does not have to pick up his leg to go home. We already seen that out of the windup so it can be difficult. You have to gauge it as a runner as soon as he comes to set because you don't have much time after that.
There goes Dyson. The throw down is second. No chance. Not even close. Hey, nobody did anything wrong there. That's just Dyson stealing a base is one of the fastest guys in Major League Baseball. That's just Jared Dyson outrunning the ball. We talk about guys that come off the bench and the Royals have two of them and him and, and Gore. They can just outrun the ball. You don't hear that very often. There's not a lot of guys in baseball. Billy Hamilton maybe. But these two guys that they have coming off the bench can outrun the ball and that's what he did. Everything was right. Everything was good. Nisha got the ball to Castro fast and he just beat the ball. And a swing and a miss to put away Orlando. That was not a very good at bat. Unfortunately for a guy coming in for defense in a big spot to add cushion make contact. So now the top of the order Alcides Escobar. Well, after Johnny Cueto was knocked around in the first three innings of this ball game, he ended with three scoreless innings. And though he will not be the beneficiary of the decision, got over those early hiccups and was able to keep it close for the Royals to come back today. A job not quite finished. It's 0 1 to Escobar. Nothing in two. When the Astros bat in their half of the ninth, they'll have Castro, Marisnik in the top of the order, Altuve, and an untapped bench. They're going to have to try to get it done against one of the toughest in the game. Wade Davis has been up in the bullpen for Kansas City as he awaits his first postseason appearance of 2015. Still 0 2 to Escobar. A bit of a weird shadow that the pitcher, little point, only one foot on the mound where you'll see when he comes back on the mound, he's got the sun in his eyes. You won't see it from the hitter, but just a little, little squint going on. There it is right there. He's out of it now. When he stands up, he'll be back in it. Squatted into right for Springer. And two runners are left stranded in scoring position in the eighth. Wade Davis trying to lock it down and get this series back to Houston. All evened up.
On top of run, a reminder that Jay and Dan are standing by. Fox Sports Live follows us here at Kauffman Stadium. They'll have a complete recap of the day in Major League Baseball. The road team taking a 2 0 lead in the Texas Toronto series. And of course, uh, live updates and previews of the games in progress and still to come in the National League. It is Wade Davis looking to take this one home for Kansas City. Jason Castro, Jake Marisnik, and Jose Altuve. It's actually a pinch hitter that leads things off. It's Jed Lowry who bats for Castro to lead things off in the ninth. Lowry and then uh, Marisnik scheduled, but another pinch hitter waits next. So it's A.J. Hinch emptying out his bench here in the top of the ninth inning. Falls behind 0 and 2. Lowry, of course, having one of the most unbelievable, improbable victories, hitting a two-run homer against the Angels, down two, two outs, nobody on. He's just hoping to get on base right now with an 0-2 count. And Davis makes quick work as a pinch hitter. That's just paint right there, John. 97 miles an hour, right on the outside corner. Hits Alvarez right in his glove. Lowry doesn't like the call. There's nothing you can do. Sometimes as a hitter, you're just frustrated that you couldn't hit the pitch, so you argue with the umpire. Not saying that's what Jed was doing, but sometimes you just argue because you know you couldn't hit it. It makes you feel better about yourself as you walk back to the dugout. The next pinch hitter will be Preston Tucker. 25 year old rookie who hit two pinch hit home runs for the Astros this year. One out base is empty top of the ninth. As valuable as Wade Davis has been in the past and in particular last year for the defending AL champs. His value was really put into the spotlight this year in the absence of Greg Holland. Served as both Holland's setup man and then after Holland, the closer. An 8 and 1 record, a career high 17 saves and 18 opportunities. Greg is here in uniform but recovering from Tommy John surgery. Davis is an equal opportunity destroyer. That is to say, tough on right handers and left handers alike. Lefties hit only 146 against him this year. This guy's the closest thing to unhittable that I've seen in a long time in the stretch that he's been in the last two years. 93, 94 mile an hour cutter. It is not a fun at bat off this guy. As a starter, when he was with Tampa Bay, he first came up, he was a starter. He didn't have the velocity. He also didn't have the cutter. And ever since he came over here to Kansas City, they tried him as a starter. It didn't work out. He went to the bullpen, found four or five miles an hour, and he found that cutter. That, that cutter that he throws is, is one of the best I've seen in a long time. It's a full count now. Three balls and two strikes to Preston Tucker. Jose Altuve waiting on deck. I know we haven't gone over this, AJ, but anything that were to come to the booth, you know you've got to get. Uh -oh. right? You're the Hall of Famer. Yeah, well, I've already made a mistake trying to go after a ball <laughs> in the booth. It didn't turn out very well. We were talking about the cutter, by the way. That pitch that Davis just threw to Tucker right there, that's the cutter. 3-1 to have the confidence right there in a one-run game, and you saw the awkward swing by Tucker. The ball just get off your barrel and jams a left-handed hitter. The payoff pitch. And ball four. The tying run on base with one away in the ninth. Well, the Astros just looking for something to generate offensively. It uh, looked good to start the day. Six hits among their first 13 batters sent to the plate. They got the home run by Rasmus. But since about the fifth inning, it's been a different story. And we're going to have a pinch runner at first base now. As Carlos Gomez will take over a board. If you want action, you got the right guy at the plate, that's for sure. This is not a boring at bat, and it should result in more than likely him swinging. And you don't have a boring guy at first either. <laughs> it's 
and Davis will check in immediately very close over there. Perhaps not as close as the fans would lead you to believe. Oh, it looks, you know, they're always going to make sure the, the, the throw, the short hop, the gloves under his chest. Whether or not the hand gets in there in time, they're going to take a look at it. See, I thought his his hand got right there. That's what looks like he's out to me, John. I'll tell you what, the short hop, great pickup. That short hop allowed his glove to already be down right there, and he makes the tag. See how the ball and the glove wow. come in at the same oh time. Oh, my goodness. If they reverse this call, that's got to be the shortest pinch running appearance in the history of the game. Yeah, it could be, and I, I think it's going to be overturned. It's got to be very conclusive. Fans reacting to the replay on the big video board here at Dolphin Stadium. They are convinced that this will be overturned. <laughs> This used to be a no-no back in the day. You could never show the replays up on the screen, and now they're getting a chance to see it put even more pressure, even though the call's coming from New York. That's the interesting part I found out from Joe Torre. We had a meeting with him in September about replay. The guys here, they don't look at the replay. They just listen to the guy in New York. So the guys that are actually here, the umpires that are here, have no say-so. They're just told what the call is. And then the go ahead RBI. Well, that's a lot of speed eliminated at first. And we said there would be action one way or another. Unfortunately for the Astros, their last hope is Altuve. Wade Davis hadn't picked off a runner in two years. He really doesn't have anybody on board against him to pick off. I'm telling you, the throw in the, in the dirt actually ended up becoming a benefactor. Because it was low and Hosmer was able to make the tag easier that way. Sal Perez is setting up across state lines. <laughs> and strike one to Altuve. Two big challenges. Two big calls overturned. Ned Yost a perfect 2 0. And that's been just a small part of the dialogue this afternoon. Big picture is that the Kansas City Royals are a strike away from avoiding going to Houston down 0 2 and having to face Dallas Keuchel in an elimination game. On the ground for Mustakis. This series is tied up at one game apiece. Tell you that is a big time snatching back for the defending American League champs. It is, and I, you know, walking in their locker room, there was nothing that you would could tell whether they were down or up, and that's the confidence of a club that went through last year, although be it boat racing until they got to the World Series. But it's a club that since spring training knows they are a very good club. When you think you're a very good club, you're not worried about where you are in a series. Well, the Royals took their first lead of the series in the last of the seventh when Ben Zobris singled in Alcides Escobar with what proves to be the decisive run of the game. Your Bank of America play of the game. Share your favorite postseason memories using hashtag MLB Memory Bank. J.P. Morosi is standing by with Ben Zobris. Thank you very much, Matt. Ben, early in this game, you're down again. You could tell the crowd was just waiting for something good to happen. What changed there in the sixth inning? Uh, well, you know, I, I think we we got the important hits. We got a, a couple breaks. You know, they, they uh, walked walked that run. You know, you got to have the little things go well. And uh, finally, we broke through in the sixth inning. The crowd was awesome uh, right there, kind of putting the pressure on them. And uh, 
we were able to uh, tie the game up there, and that, that's big, you know, going into the last three innings. Ben, the Royals got you in part because of your postseason experience. How much did that help you there with your great approach there in the seventh inning with the infield in? You know, uh, just trying to focus on having a good at bat. Harris is, uh, has been really tough all year on hitters, and, um, you know, he threw a good first pitch. The second one was up a little bit, just enough where I could put the barrel on it. And, uh, you know, any way I can help this club, that's what I'm trying to do. Offense, defense, whatever. Um, you know, I just happen to be in a good spot where Eski got to third with nobody out. You know, if, if that doesn't happen, uh, it's not that situation. So uh, thankful for the opportunity and, and uh, glad I was able to come through for the team. Ben, you know who's waiting for you, of course, on Sunday. Dallas Keuchel in Houston. How much confidence does this win give you now heading into game three? Well, it's huge. Uh, you know, we, we had to win this game. You know, going into game three, you know, obviously he's a tough pitcher. Uh, we've got our work cut out for us. But, um, you know, we believe he's ready to uh, have a bad one. So hopefully hopefully he can leave a few more pitches over the middle of the plate for us and uh, we can get to him in that game. But, um, you know, we'll enjoy this one today and get focused again for the next one. Thanks so much, Ben. All right, thank Matt, you. back to you. JP, thanks. The Royals able to even up this series at one win apiece. Jay and Dan are standing by at the Fox Sports Live studios in Los Angeles. Guys.